Welcome to the Committee of the Whole Meeting of the Cape Coral City Council. Today is February 22nd, 2023. This meeting now comes to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Gunther. Here. Council Members Costin. Here. Cummings. Here. Hayden. Here. Long. Here. Shepard. Here. Steinke. Here. Welsh. Here. All present. Item 4 is business. 4A is citizens input time. Citizens input is a maximum of 60 minutes. Is set for the input of citizens on matters concerning city government. Three minutes per individual. Please remember to state your name. We utilize the podium to my left, your right. Anyone wishing to speak during citizens input? Seeing none, citizens input is now closed. We will move on to item 4B. Uh, 4B1 discussions uh, PFA S litigation, Mr. City Manager. Good morning, Mayor and Council. This item is brought before you um, for consideration regarding some um, chemicals and the possibility of uh, retaining a firm. Um, Mr. Pearson is at the uh, podium for a presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Jeff Pearson, Utilities Director. I'd like to give you a brief presentation on uh, the uh, litigation for PFOS. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, PFOS is uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances that are synthetic. Uh, they're man-made chemical compounds. The EPA says there are over 14,000 unique PFOS chemical compounds and the company PubChem lifts approximately 6 million. PFOS, PFOA, and other PFOSs are described as persistent organic pollutants because they can remain in the environment for many, uh, many years. Uh, they don't break down naturally and they are considered forever chemicals because of the stability of the carbon fluorine atoms that bond uh, the graphic representation there is what they look like from an atomic structure standpoint. Where did they come from? They started, uh, they were developed in the 1940s <clears throat> in products and materials due to their enhanced water resistant properties. They're in cosmetics, Scotchgard, Teflon, firefighting phloem, just to name a few. Um, Some of the human health concerns which are still being researched, uh, this graphic is from the European Environmental Agency. Uh, the solid lines, they believe that there's a high certainty that it could cause the various um, health issues on this graphic. And the dotted lines, there's a lower certainty, but they think uh, it could be tied to some of these health issues. Uh, this is a graphic representation on how PFOS cycles through the environment. Um, it can be from a manufacturing and industrial use. Um, in the agriculture area, they can reuse uh, biosolids by land application of wastewater sludge and that can leach down into or uh, into the aquifers or run off into surface water bodies. Uh, PFOS uh, is in firefighting foam. Uh, fire chief says we don't use the PFOS firefighting foam anymore. We use a more environmental friendly type foam now. Uh, it can be in landfills, older landfills that are unlined 
Uh, it could leach or run off from those sources uh, at drinking water treatment plants. Um, we, if especially surface water treatment plants that are pulling off of a surface water body. Fortunately, the city of Cape Coral uh, is, gets their drinking water from deep underground aquifers, so we don't have that issue with our drinking water. Um, in residential areas and wastewater treatment plants. Bioaccumulation of these uh, chemical compounds can be transferred into the tissue of exposed organisms and they can accumulate over time. Uh, scientists estimate that 97% of the population has trace PFOSs in their blood and tissue. As far as drinking water and wastewater, an estimated 26,000 sites in the United States are contaminated with PFOSs, and at least 6 million Americans are estimated to have drinking water contain, containing these PFOSs above the safe limit published prior to last year by the EPA. A formal EPA rule is coming to add PFOA and PFOS as hazardous chemicals. It was first issued for comment back in August of last year. Uh, Bioaccumulation can happen when animals higher up in the food chain accumulate more PFOS and they, this PFOS is already in the prey that they consume. This is a graphic of uh, DDT, which was an insecticide, how, how this uh, biomagnification can happen, where it, uh, you build up toxins within the food chain. Uh, you know, it can start as small as from algae and work its way up to humans. Some of the remediation solutions include uh, sorption, granular activated carbon, biochar, ion exchange, <coughs> precipitation flo flocculation and coagulation, which is primarily used at surface water treatment plants, uh, redox, membrane filtration, reverse osmosis, nanofiltration, and supercritical water oxidation. All of these remediation solutions are expensive and uh, would require significant infrastructure. You may ask, is it in our drinking water? The answer is no. We get our water from deep underground aquifers that are considered to be over 10,000 years old. We're actually mining that water. And we also use the RO, which if it were in the water, it would be removed. Um, also, uh, it could be in our surface water sources, such as our canals, and could be detected in shallow aquifers where private wells are tapped. There's ongoing PFOS litigation. Uh, it was filed in U.S. District Court of South Carolina and includes more than 100 communities throughout the country as part of what is referred to as the aqueous film forming foams multi-district litigation. South Carolina has been designated as the central location for all proceedings for many of the claims. Uh, the reason why we should potentially join the litigation is that the EPA could uh, publish rules that would, could potentially cost us millions of dollars in additional infrastructure to remove and treat these PFOS tainted water. Um, and the companies that produce these dangerous products should be held accountable and pay the cost for the remediation. There is attached to this agenda packet is a draft legal services agreement. The attorneys, uh, there's three firms uh, on the draft. It's Scott, Summy, Barron, and Bud. PC, Phil Kosich, Kosich, Summich, Parciola, and Taylor, LLC, and Manson, Bulbus, Donaldson, Tanner, PA, would be the firms if council decides to move forward 
on a contingency basis to join this litigation. And I stand by for any questions you may have. I also have one of the um, uh, firm owners, Laura Donaldson Jacobs, Laura Jacobs Donaldson here to answer any questions that you may have about the litigation and the draft agreement. If you want to proceed with um, bringing this to a regular council meeting and joining the litigation. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions for me real quick. Um, item number seven under the service agreement, attorney fees. Could you talk about that a little more? Uh, you know, the calculation of a contingent fee, uh, it says in here attorneys will receive a contingency fee of 25% of any gross recovery. So is this uh, solely, uh, you know, something that uh, if, if a uh, case came forward, then there would be a fee involved? Is this a, some type of a, uh, you know, is there a fee for, on a yearly basis? So if you could maybe go over the, uh, the uh, attorney fees in this. Um, good morning. So my name is Laura Donaldson, and I'm a shareholder at Manson Bulbas Donaldson Tanner. Um, I have, um, uh, for many years, have worked with City of Cape Coral on water issues. Um, it's been a while. Uh, we, uh, I helped negotiate the City of Cape Coral with Fort Myers with the pipeline and the reclaim water. And so over the years, Jeff and I have kept in contact about different issues. And so when this issue came up, I was like, hey, Jeff, have you guys looked at um, your PFAS issues? Because some of my clients have been surprised about PFAS in their water and wastewater. And um, so I just wanted to kind of give some background that this is, um, uh, I have done some legal work for the city of Cape Coral in the past. So it relates to the contingency fee. It's 25%. So right now, the way that the, so the, let me go back. So the, there's hundreds of cases that are filed across the, the country and they're all in um, Charleston. And so we've just seen the first couple of them are starting to be settled because the first case is going to trial this June. And that's the, the federal judge picked out of all the cases of the entire country, picked the city of Stewart down on the east coast of Florida. Um, so what is being envisioned as part of, and they've been doing mediation. Um, I'm a lawyer, I've paid mediators before. It's $85,000 a day for a mediator um, on this issue because it's so complex. So what the settlement that's occurred so far, because we don't really know what the settlements are gonna look for, there's gonna be ongoing costs. This is not just increasing, like putting infrastructure in and it's a one and done. Um, they are looking at increase, um, ongoing increased costs over 20 years to operate the system. So if for the city of Cape Coral, if you have PFAS um, in your wastewater and your treat, your facility is gonna cost $20 million to upgrade, and then it's a million dollars more to operate that system because of this upgrade. So the 25% contingency fee would be based on the collective of everything that the city would be getting. Okay, and uh, one last quick question. Uh, have we did an analysis to see if that is existent, uh, Mr. Pearson, in our, in our wastewater? No, sir, we have not, um, but it's highly likely that it is. Um, we, we had to test under the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule our drinking water, and we did not find it. Um, but there's a high likelihood if I were to go out right now and pull a sample that we would find it. Okay. Council members, thank you. And, and can I just add real yes. quickly, sorry, um, it's everywhere. Like if you got your blood tested, you would probably find one of the chemicals in your bloodstream. I mean, this chemical is everywhere. And I know that we focused on the utilities, but I have a fire district that we have filed lawsuit because um, the manufacturers of the phone would come and do testing at our site in a stormwater pond. <coughs> so we, I mean, it's just, it, it is everywhere, unfortunately. Um, I will say, because um, I have told my clients, the city hasn't done anything wrong. There's currently no regulatory limits. Um, I think that's something that's really important. But uh, to put things in perspective, last summer, the health advisory level was 70 parts per trillion, which is seven drops in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And now it's down to point 
004, which isn't even a single drop of PFAS in a swimming pool. Okay, council members, thank you. Thank you, so um, I am fully supportive that we should uh, be protected in this for uh, the potential you know, financial impact uh, on any future regulations that are brought or uh, in, in requirements to uh, clean up anything that we're required to clean up. So I, I, I fully support it. I do have a question uh, in 7C when it talks about reasonable fees um, uh, if the contingent fee is unenforceable. Obviously reasonable uh, is a subjective term. Could you give us some type of framework around what that could or should look like? You know, because I don't, we don't know what improvements will be required for the city. And if you have any soil contamination related to any of your fire training facilities, I can't really answer that question. I can get um, one of the attorneys who's settling these cases um, to provide you a response if that works for you. And is there, is there a reason why uh, the contingent fee would uh, be unenforceable? Um, and I, I apologize, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I should be going through, uh, out of all the years I've done legal work, this is the first time I've actually been to a um, council meeting. Um, Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was telling Mr. Pearson, I thought I was lost because all of a sudden this beautiful building showed up and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, now I know all the years uh, with this stuff. The, uh, this is a standard contract that's being used across the state. So every state has different regulations. And so that's why that provision is in. Um, historically, 25% um, is found reasonable in Florida. It's deemed to be reasonable, um, but it's just a standard provision that's in contingency contracts. Because okay. the law could change too, right? Um, so, so my final question then would be to our city attorney. Is, is this something that uh, we as a council should be concerned about, uh, 7C? I think it's something that you should be concerned about and really be looking into participating in. Um, no, my, my direct question was in, in, in regard to um, reasonable fees um, that are unenforceable, that's not defined and there's no cap on them. Is that something that we should be concerned about entering into this agreement? I don't think so, no. Okay, thank you. Any other council members? Uh, just one last question for me. I know we have about 411 uh, municipalities, townships, or villages here in Cape Coral, about 67 counties. Uh, that's just in the state of Florida. Uh, so one of the things that kind of jumps out at me is I think the participation in this program uh, countrywide is about 100 uh, cities. Is that what you, uh, is that what the presentation was, Mr. Pearson? Or? I can answer. It's okay. actually more. Or if you can answer that. Yeah, I can. So it's more, it's growing every day. I, so this litigation has been going on for four years. Um, and it's just now that the trial has been set in the first case, mm -hmm. more like I've got, I've had two clients um, agree in the last two months. And so it's just starting to pick up speed because they are getting closer to settling. Um, and, and these are big numbers. Uh, Sioux City, $600 million. Um, is what they're seeking for damages. And, and so you will see there's a lot of local governments in California. In Florida, I can tell you, um, sorry, I do have. Um, Hillsborough County, City of Zephyr Hills, Sanford Airport Authority, City of Lauderdale, Pensacola, Tampa, Tampa Bay Water, Melbourne, Pasco County, Monroe County, City of Plantation, Tallahassee, Martin County, City of Ocala. So it's growing. I can also tell you I'm working with the Florida League of Cities and in two weeks, uh, we're doing a presentation to the um, members' attorneys. They've got like a webinar on PFOS to get the information out because what we have found is the utility side of the cities are just like, okay, this any other regulation that comes out from the state or federal government, okay, we're just gonna have to build this into our rates and that's the path that they're going on. And they're really not talking to the legal side because it's just like any other regulation. We've got to build this in. 
Um, and so the point of this webinar really is to inform city officials that there is an option to try to get, I mean, these regulations are coming, so either cities are gonna pay 100% or they may only be paying 25 or 35% depending on the cost. And, um, and so it is starting to pick up steam in the state of Florida. Okay, thank you. Mr. City Manager. Good morning. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions as it relates to a possibility of a, a class. Um, if we end up, if this proceeds and ends up becoming a class action uh, suit, uh, what happens with this arrangement and the fee structure? It would still be in place. Okay. Um, and then in regards to a, a class action uh, settlement, um, this remaining in force, once the, um, the gross is distributed, um, I don't see anything in, in here. If, if the gross less your fees um, ends up, the, if the, let me see what I'm trying to say here, the costs of the expenses exceed the 75% that's left, are we, we would be paying those costs? It's not, that will not happen. I, I hope that, yeah, well, I just I, wanna make sure I understand the, the arrangement. Yeah, I mean, if, if it would be more comfortable, we could put some language in to make that clear that that would not be a possibility. I mean, the intent in talking to, so I've been just recently added to part of the team. I haven't been dealing, um, I've been working on the state legislative and regulatory side of it, not the litigation side. I am. Um, and so, but I can get that clarified and add some language for you on how they would, because um, my understanding is that their goal is that every client is getting, you know, a, is getting at least 65 to 75% of everything that they need. Thank you. Council Member Hayden. Yeah, I, <clears throat> no issues with, we need to be protected on this, but are there two separate things that work here? Those that uh, may file suit against a particular city because they're claiming they develop a serious illness from uh, PFOS, and then we other have the other side of uh, what regulations may be developed because of this. We're not fighting. The issue is those that may file suit. We're not necessarily looking at fighting any federal regulations that may come, that may develop from this, correct? Correct. Okay. And we know these federal regulations are coming. Correct. And we know it's going to cost us something. A substantial if amount If we have something. to modify our wastewater plant or whatever. So either way, we know there's going to be an impact. Correct. With this, correct? Okay. I mean, it, I have to say, it is safe. I normally don't say you should assume anything, right? I mean, there's a oh, whole saying right. on it. But I would say it is safe to assume that you have PFAS in, in your wastewater. And you could potentially add your fire stations, depending on how they right. trained with the foam, could have soil contamination as and are, well. Are most of the suits in South Carolina focused on what may have been in the foam or what may have been in the wastewater? Is that is that the targeted areas for, for the suits there? So they are going after the manufacturers, so it's more than just the foam. Just the foam is one of the, the, the big impacts. Right. Um, but there's leaching, like if you had, um, like carpets have it, so there's leaching into the aquifer from like um, your landfills, it's in your landfills, I mean, so it's leaching in. Okay. So the issue that comes in is the manufacturers knew that this was harmful to the environment as well as to humans, and they continue to manufacture it. So it really is going after, trying to hold the people who put this, you know, it's different if they didn't know, and then once they found out, they stopped, but the there's been, 45 million pages of discovery in this case, and they knew that this was causing, could cause cancer if consumed in large quantities, and they continue to manufacture it. Is this another one of those that were, we could see law firms, more law firms joining in and defending clients like we're seeing with Camp Lejeune? And is this gonna be another one of those that uh, may uh, springboard into yeah, so, and I'll give some background. So I represent, uh, one of my clients is down in Collier County, and I got an email, and it said, hey, we were at this rural utility conference, and there was a law firm there that was setting, that was trying to get us to sign up right. to do this litigation. And I said, well, send me the information, I'll take a look at it. 
And what I noticed was that this law firm, um, they were new to the game. They weren't part of the steering committee. They weren't part of the executive committee. And the way that they were structuring their fees was that the National Rural Utility Association was gonna get the money and then they would decide how it was broken down by states and then the state association was gonna break it down on its members. And I honestly, I told my client, you're gonna get nothing or a very s small amount and let me investigate some of the law firms. We re it's very important to pick someone who's on the executive committee of and the steering committee related to these type of litigations. And so um, I knew the city is Upper Hills city attorney and I talked to him and this was the firm that they hired and I talked to a couple other people and these are the people who are in the know. And so that's why, um, that's why I decided to partner with them because they're the ones who are litigating the case. I can tell you, I am not the one litigating the case. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Council Member Cummings. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you. I have a couple of questions um, because it's obvious going to be obviously going to be a class action lawsuit here. Um, with us moving forward with this, you know, we're going to have a lot of residents going to come forward and saying, oh, I have a thyroid issue, my cholesterol levels higher. Um, once this is out in the open, we're going to see a lot of people coming to us and calling. Where are we going to refer them to? So if you have residents coming forward with a lot of these symptoms that you put out there, uh, what are we going to say to them? And who do they call to put their name on the list? Would it be your firm? So um, I can get that information. I know that we're focusing on utilities and companies and really, but there are law firms that are doing it from a personal injury standpoint as part of it. Because this is gonna open up <laughs> to the public. So I, I would like us to be prepared for that. The other question I have to ask too, um, with this, are we having to pay for this or is this something that is going to be waived until uh, we win this lawsuit? I mean, how, how is this working? Um, so it's free. Okay. And like um, Mr. Pearson asked me, how much was it gonna cost? Because I. Right now, my firm, we have a, a matter that I could charge to. You're not being charged for me coming down here. I mean, this is a contingency basis. If we're unsuccessful, um, you don't pay. Okay. I, I just want to clarify that. That's, that's what I thought. Um, so, with, you know, I'm all for this as well, uh, but I feel that we will need <clears throat> to have further information that we can put up on our website so if people want to contact us you know they're not calling us individually on what to do i've got symptoms um, i've been in and out and seen the doctor all of a sudden i have cancer could this pertain to this case if, if there's a way that you can help us direct the residents on who and where to go for this type of information uh, we can do that. I, I, um, the firm, uh, we have a, pu a press release that could be provided to your PIO, um, as well as the other information. I can tell you that, um, so a few years ago, so uh, Mr. Pearson talked about the uncontaminated, um, un the UCMR, which is a testing that you have to do by the federal government. When that happened a few years ago, uh, there were several utilities in the state of Florida who had very high levels from a drinking water standpoint mm -hmm. above the health advisory level. And so DEP immediately stepped in and they took steps to shut down wells and start um, providing water or other, uh, other options to make sure that there was safe drinking water for those residents. And so for, um, for the city of Cape Coral, what's nice is you're not testing positive for PFAS in your drinking water system and so but we can address that from a public relations standpoint but right now you you don't PFOS is not showing up any of the there's 26 of them none of them are showing up in your drinking water standards correct and I'd also like to mention uh, as I briefly spoke in the presentation there's a lot of research still going on um, and even if you go on the EPA's website they don't say 
100% this is what it causes. Um, they have um, some research that seems to point to some of the health issues that could potentially happen if you're consuming uh, PFOS or you have high levels in your body um, that could, could happen, but the science, the, the research isn't 100% at this time, so really to say, well, you know, I'm this PFOS caused this, that's something that's still being vetted out, if you will, in the health community and the scientific community. So, you know, that's something that it's really unknown at this time. They, they believe it, there's a problem, but they don't know it 100%. But we can provide that information. Okay, thank you. Council Member Long. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I guess I'll just chime in really briefly. Um, you know, I don't think this is anything that's out of the ordinary. I think it's pretty standard. Um, there's no reason why we shouldn't do this. Um, just to clarify, one of the points Steinke made, Councilmember Steinke made with regards to the fees, it's, it's a 25% contingency fee, but then there are also going to be costs associated with that, that that we technically will come out of any sort of settlement if there's a pre prevailing party that, that usually under no circumstances would we be responsible for any of that. Um, having said that, I don't think that we should expect some huge windfall uh, from this. I think it's going to end up being the equivalent of the $5 check you get in the mail from eating Cheerios in 1995, uh, especially considering the number of municipalities that are going to be involved. Uh, and that's not a, a detriment to them. That's just typically how they, they work. Um, but with that being said, I don't think there's any concern. And I did just want to clarify, I think Council Member Hayden pointed uh, towards it, and I believe she answered it as well. This has nothing to do with, this engagement has nothing to do with them representing us in some sort of defensive litigation against individual citizens or collectives here. Their job is to protect us as a municipality uh, with regards to our utilities plan. So that's completely independent of anything that's going on here with, with this engagement. Um, one thing I am particularly interested in is uh, where I can get information on becoming a uh, water contaminant mediator at 85,000 a day. Uh, so any information that you have on that, <laughs> I, would, I would certainly welcome. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm in support of this. I don't have any issues with, move, with allowing them to move forward and, and uh, put us into the pool, so to speak. Thank you. Yeah, I will say we normally pay like five or $600 an hour. So when I found out how much they were getting, the mediator that's been selected is the mediator who dealt with the um, opiate and was able to successfully um, get that issue resolved, which did result in more than a $5 uh, check for local governments um, and the state. And so, um, yeah, I was like, I need to figure out how to get on, um, on that side because what they don't tell you that yeah, you also get the fees ahead of time preparing for it. So sure. one day of mediation, you could, you know, make a million dollars off of it. You figure it out. Take me with you. <laughs> well, Council Member Long, if you come up missing, we know where to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. I guess uh, what the direction staff is trying to attain here today is if we want to uh, move forward in this type of an agreement. Um, so I guess... We'll start down with Council Member Long. I, I think it's a simple yes or no. Yes. 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 Good. Great. Mr. City Manager, it looks like you got the uh, direction you're looking for. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you uh, for the presentation and, and uh, for coming today, ma'am. Thank you. And welcome to your first uh, council meeting. Okay, we'll move on to item 4B2, uh, UEP grants. Uh, Mr. Mason, it looks like uh, you're up this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Mark Mason, Financial Services Director. Uh, let me see if I can get this thing up and running here. I know I had it up and running. Is there feedback? Feel like when I'm breathing, it's it's doing something. Okay, I think we're up and running. All right, so. Mayor and Council Members, Mark Mason, Financial Services Director. Uh, I think the primary reason why we're here is because there, uh, I think we, we want to make sure that there's no, whoa, we want to make sure that there's no misunderstandings about 
what we've done with regard to uh, grants for water, sewer, and irrigation uh, with regard to the UEP or what we've done in the past or what we intend to do in the future. Uh, and to understand what's available to us uh, you know, from either the federal government, the state government, uh, local governments, uh, such as the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, uh, and I don't think there's any others that we can talk about, but th that's primarily it. So today, uh, besides uh, Mr. Klingon and myself uh, from city staff that we're gonna be talking about, we also contract with Tetra Tech, uh, who, who subcontracts with Angie Brewer and Associates uh, both of which have served the city for over 30 years with regard to uh, our UEP program as well as the acquisition of grants when they're available for any portion of the UEP uh, as well as the SRF grants uh, which uh, or SRF loans which are considered to be grants for reporting purposes in the state of Florida. As you can see from uh, in talking about Tetra Tech and Angie Brewer, Tetra Tech has its own uh, primary arm with regard to grants, uh, but at the same time, they subcontract with Angie Brewer, uh, and Angie Brewer has uh, supported us in a number of SRF uh, loans as well as other grants over the years. Uh, and basically, they're, they specialize in grants and loans for local government agencies, and Mark Brewer, Brewer who is here with us today, is, as is uh, Brett Mesner from uh, Tetra Tech. Uh, the, Mark has 30 years of experience uh, working with the city as well, and he has procured over $6 billion in funding during his career. And that's not $6 billion for the city of Cape Coral, but that's for all their clients. So one of the questions that really just seems to be out there, and it's, it, it, it's always out there, is that why does it always seem that there's always so much money that's available? Well, frankly, because it is. However, there's a catch with everything. All of these grants that you see here through the Infrastructure and Jobs Act are not available to us. As an example, for airports and federal administration, you know, we don't have an airport, so we're not gonna, certainly not going to receive any of those types of grants. Broadband uh, has been basically restricted to rural areas for the most part throughout the United States. And so we're not necessarily going to uh, receive any of those grants. And we have applied for those grants and have not received them. Uh, we also have a number of different other that are there uh, that may be available to us you know, when we apply for them. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that when we do apply for grants, uh, there may be more that's on top of that uh, that we may end up having to fund in the future in order to keep those things running after the fact. So typically, the amount that is reported is spread across a whole host of industries that you can see. Uh, we, from an example, you know, the roads and bridges, ports, airports. We've applied for a couple of infrastructure grants already up underneath this program. Uh, we were not successful the first time around. Uh, we recycled that grant for 24th Avenue. Uh, and we expect to see whether we receive anything associated with 24th uh, Avenue uh, later on in the calendar year. They're also uh, targeted to very specific project types. Uh, most of the Infrastructure uh, and Jobs Act money for larger uh, projects such as bridges and roads are generally going towards much larger cities. Uh, and that have these types of bridges. I think you've seen some of the uh, documentation on TV or uh, even in the paper where uh, the president has been up in Pennsylvania to talk about some of the bridges that are up there uh, and things like that. But for us, when we're looking at, uh, you know, and understanding where all these funds are at, every single city, county, and municipality across the United States, all 6,500 of them, are all competing for the same amount of money. And so it all comes down to whether our competition or whether our grant application meets the terms and conditions of what it is that the granting agencies are looking to dole out. Some of the best grant opportunities that we have available to us uh, with regard to the UEP are reclaimed water, which you'll see later on. We'll talk a little bit about that. Septic to sewer when it's available, basin management action plan, and which are in basin management action plan areas. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this presentation. Just some of the grant basics as you're thinking about grants is number one, uh, you, you, it needs to be shovel ready. And so I think the question is, is what does shovel ready mean? That means that we're ready to go out to contract and it means that we're ready to turn dirt for a, for a construction project. 
In effect, the, uh, if we're in a design, you can get grants for designs. You certainly can, and, uh, and we have in the past. But for the most part, grants are generally uh, related to travel, uh, correctly, shovel-ready projects. When it really comes to grants, there's in many cases, we'll go out and we'll get a grant, we'll have the grant, and we still might have to wait before they actually start spending the money, which might be sometime in the future. With the UEP, uh, you know, assuming the city council approves the UEP in late March, we approve the contracts in late March, we'll end up still having to buy the materials before we ever turn a, uh, you know, uh, you know, one shovel uh, of dirt, which may be four or five months later down the road after we get, after we receive much of the materials that's going to have to go into the ground. Sometimes the timeline or the availability of funding may not be realistic for our projects. Uh, that would depend on when we're actually going to get the, the funding, and you'll see that uh, when we talk about one of the, uh, the loan programs, the timing issue might be that it's not good for the timing of doing the project. And of course, we always have the issue about contractors holding prices and whether they have the ability to hold prices for an extended period of time you know, debating on whether, whether we're going to get a grant for a project or not. For federal grants, of which there are not many associated with you, uh, the utility program, but what for federal grants, we also have some additional requirements associated with federal grants. We have the Build America, Buy America requirement associated with a federal grant. We also have Davis-Bacon wage rates, uh, as well as other requirements associated with reporting uh, requirements that go along with federal grants and end up increasing the overall cost of the project in order to recover those, those grant funds. So Build America, Buy America essentially requires that for if you're going to use financial assistance, you're required to purchase all your steel, uh, iron, manufactured products, and any construction material used in the product, product uh, sorry, project, it, you know, must be produced in the United States. So there may be times when you're out there getting a federal assistance grant and you find that uh, you know, some of the products that you're looking at and trying to procure may not be available within the United States. And so then you also have to go through waiver potential, potential waiver projects, uh, proposed type of projects. Or from a timing standpoint, the timing of actually receiving the grant and being able to do the project is dependent on the, the, the materials to be able to do the project. In addition, on the Davis-Bacon wage rates, uh, this is a requirement uh, that the Department of Labor is required to publish these rates, but essentially, if you're going to receive financial assistance, you must pay the laborers and mechanics no less than the locally prevailing rates or wages and fringe benefits for corresponding work on similar projects. So when you're doing a utility project here, you know, we have other utility projects that are not funded associated with a grant, so they would aggregate that information, make a determination of what the prevailing wage rates are, and for whatever that future one is, is that you would have to pay that rate or any higher rate. And so what ends up happening with that is that it's like a, a stepping stone. It ends up increasing the cost over, uh, over time with regard to federal projects, whereas if you're not funding it with a federal grant, the cost of labor may be less. More importantly, when you're dealing with funding requirements, sometimes they're typically applicable to the entire project area. So you're not really looking at just a localized event where you're going to be utilizing those funds, but it's going to be the entire project area. So one of the things that uh, you know, we wanted to you know, make very clear about the UEP grants and any grants for the UEP areas is that we do have limiting factors. First and foremost, the project area is not within the BMAP area, and the BMAP area is the uh, Basin Management Action Plan area. This is something that is established by the state of Florida. And uh, in this particular case, North One West has no properties associated with the BMAP area. North One East has certain little portions associated with the project area that do. The project area is not in a statewide alternative restoration plan status. So what does that mean, alternative restoration plan status? As I understand it, in reading the, the documentation that's online with the DEP, and, and it, 
I mean, I have other experts here that can probably speak better about this. They speak stormwater, I don't. Uh, is that the alternative, uh, a statewide alternative restoration plan status is like the beginning of something. It's where you have identified an area and you've come to an agreement or the state has identified an area that is, is basically uh, providing pollutants into, a, in, into an estuary such as a river or otherwise and that it's a voluntary program where you've kind of developed a plan and said, hey, we'll go and fix this. But when, and at the same time, because the BMAP process is so long, this is basically an interim step before you actually get to a, uh, the basin management plan, action plans. And so because we're in a, because a portion of South, uh, Northeast One is in, uh, uh, North One East is in a basin management plan, there's no particular alternative restoration plan that's available for this particular area. However, there are others within the state of Florida, and I can show them to you on the map if you'd like to see them. The city does not meet the economic demographic requirements uh, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This is uh, important because many of the, pro uh, the grants come through either through the DEP or the Department of Agriculture, and we don't meet those conditions or the economic demographics within the city of Cape Coral. Of course, you have the federal requirements for the uh, Build America and Buy America, Davis, Wake, Davis uh, Bacon apply to these limiting factors. In other words, you might get a grant and the cost of the increase and in the cost of actually managing the grant within the overall project cost may exceed the, co the, the benefit of the grant itself. Stormwater treatment impact is low. Uh, project is just in, in here for Northeast One, I correction, North One West, UEP. Our treatment impact is different, is, is low, because all we're doing is really just replacing stuff. We're not actually adding anything uh, stormwater-wise to the North One area that is going to decrease the overall uh, or reduce the non-point source pollution that may be flowing in, in as I understand it, the, all the water flows towards uh, the, the, the uh, Pine Island area as opposed to the Caloosahatchee River. And so, with, and so for us, the only thing that we're really doing in this particular area that we have implied, that we have applied for and have received a grant for is the replacement of the, uh, the catch basin, the catch basin system within the North One West area. The, I think it should be also under, you know, clear that when it really comes to the funding for uh, replacement of utilities or replacement of sewer lines, the septic to sewer program, for us, uh, for grants, targeting pollution cr cleanup is more important than in providing uh, sewer replacement for growth. And so for us, much of uh, you know, what we're you know, supporting the UEP is, is to allow for continued growth. It's not so much a position where we're, we're in a pollution position where we have to go and replace this because we're polluting something. In our case, we're doing the UEP primarily because of growth. So to give you an idea of where we stand with regard to the BMAP or with regard to uh, the, uh, and how North One West and North One East fits into that, we've overlaid the North One uh, West as well as the North One East areas in, re in relation to the BMAP area. The BMAP area is all in the green. So you can see all of North One West, which is on the west side of uh, Del Prado Boulevard, is not included in the BMAP area. On the east, we have a portion of contract seven as well as a portion of contract 11, which is included in the BMAP area. So what that means for us, and I'll say this again later, is that for North One East, we will apply for the septic to sewer because it meets the terms and conditions of that grant program uh, with regard to Florida DEP. If you're not in the BMAP area, it's unlikely you're going to receive any funding from DEP because their primary goal is to reduce the pollutants going into uh, particular estuaries throughout the state of Florida. In addition, for future UEPs from the, uh, in its proximity to the, to the BMAP, again, uh, in this particular circumstance, uh, there's a small portion in North 8 that may be associated with the BMAP, uh, but for the remainder of the city, as of today, none are in, in the BMAP area. 
And so the septic to sewer program that is provided currently by the state of Florida, and we'll assume that it will continue uh, into the future, uh, would not necessarily be available to us uh, for this future UEPs. In addition, we also had the septic density issues that we've talked about with you before when we went through the, with the, uh, the master plan, the utilities master plan, of course, you know, from an expertise uh, matter. I have others here that can actually get up here and talk about this uh, better than I can, but we've met the obligation with regard to the, with, to the septic system to avoid any type of moratorium on the city because we have developed a, a master plan. Uh, the master plan calls for putting in sept, uh, sewer, sewer systems throughout the remainder of the city, and that would avoid over a period of time uh, the, the, any moratoriums that may be applied to the city if we stopped the program. The right now north one west density is approximately 50%. That's fairly high. I think uh, we have a lower number that uh, drives the need to actually start the design for a UEP area before we start the construction. But again, uh, if, we don't, if we don't do any of this, if we stop, whatever, uh, if DEP could put a moratorium on any development in the city, is it moving forward with the construction of municipal sewer in the future? UEP driven by growth, again, for us, uh, you know, it's not a matter of we're targeting pollution cleanup, which many of the grants that have been applied, uh, that uh, have been provided by the state of Florida over the last couple of years have done. Uh, for us, it's a matter of growth. It's not a matter of uh, pollution cleanup. So some of the things that, like, where are we today? So first and foremost, for North One West, we have applied for and have received a grant from South Florida Water Management District in the amount of $1.4 million. Uh, this is specifically for irrigation mains that are in the in contracts three, four, and five. We've also applied for a little over a, almost $12 million for additional grants through South Florida Water Management District that is reclaimed water. And again, this goes back to the original discussion that we have that, you know, there are primary sources of revenue for us with regards to the UEP is going to be more reclaimed water or irrigation related than is going to be sewer or water itself. So in this case, we're looking at, uh, you know, obtaining additional funding to replace the mains and contracts area three, four, five, and then we'd, we'd be, we would also be applying for the replacement of the irrigation mains and contracts one, two, and six. I think the important part about this grant application is that $5.1 million would go towards the collection and distribution uh, square foot assessment. So overall, the assessment associated with the irrigation could be reduced if we're awarded this grant by $5.1 million. The remainder would go to the larger pipes that are associated with uh, the irrigation system, the treatment and transmission portion of the, the system. In addition, we're looking at applying for the state, wa state uh, water quality assistance grant, which is called a SWAG grant. I think we've gotten these in the past. Uh, in this case, it's to replace the UEP catch basins, as you'll, as you'll note that uh, by replacing the catch basins and putting in newer catch basins, we can reduce the overall pollutant load that ends up into our canals and potentially ends up into the, uh, into the Pine Island area. And so we would be looking at $4 million for this. This is not associated with the assessment, but it is associated with the stormwater portion of the grant, of the, of the program. As you'll recall, I believe the overall uh, stormwater portion of this program for North One West is in the $20 million area, so this would certainly help with reducing how much we would end up having to borrow associated with that program. So we kind of want to go through some of the grant opportunities or some of the funding opportunities that are associated with the UEP. We've talked already about the infrastructure grants, the fact that the majority of the infrastructure grants are not available to us for the UEP, but we wanted to give you an idea that it just seems like there's a lot of money out there, but there's always a catch with whatever money there is available. So with South Florida Water Management District, uh, as we've already pointed out, we've received a $1.4 million grant. We've applied for an additional $12 million, of which uh, a portion of that could be applied towards the assessment if it's received and if it's awarded. <clears throat> the one thing about uh, grant funds from South Florida Water Management District is that they're very, 
the grants are only within the district boundaries. In other words, all of, this, all of the counties that make up South Florida Water Management District, which are basically us, uh, Collier County, all the way over to Broward County, Miami-Dade County, et cetera, uh, Palm Beach County. Those are all the counties that, are, that make up South Florida Water Management District. Uh, there are no monitoring requirements associated with this. In other words, uh, the, you know, we, file, we file our reports, we, and then you know, it's on a reimbursement basis. We get the money back, and we move on. Again, uh, there, the cons with this, like anything else, there's going to be a matching funds required. I, don't think we, I think we understand from the matching fund requirements. We cover that. Uh, but again, with South Florida Water Management District, the, fund, the project does need to be shovel ready. Uh, it, interestingly, uh, I think we were here before you maybe about uh, six months ago when we were awarded a grant for the irrigation tanks that we put out there uh, by Chiquita. And they had already been constructed, but the grant was awarded to us, and so we utilized those funds associated with that and saved a little bit of money that we would have normally used from Water and Sewer Fund in order to build those tanks. So we also have the American Rescue Plan Act. These funds came down as a direct allocation to cities and counties throughout the United States as part of that, uh, that program. The city received $25.5 million uh, for the program. Right now, the, the majority of those funds are being allocated to Master Pump Station 100 and the force main projects into the CRA in order to support any future growth in that area in the CRA. Any funds left over will be applied to whatever additional uh, sewer projects that we will have, uh, you know, associated with the, uh, at least as we recommend that, uh, that we would utilize those funds for any additional sewer projects that we may have. We looked at utilizing these funds, whatever might have been left over associated with this, but since we haven't finished out or haven't bid out, we, we did bid out Master Pump Station 100, we got a bid back, we rejected the bid, we're going back out. We don't know exactly how much we're gonna have left over, but we did look at applying about $6 million of these funds to the program associated with the utilities, and uh, it would have been associated with one uh, contract area. And if we had gone back out for bid associated with all of the Build America, Buy America for that contract area, as well as the uh, the wage rates, uh, et cetera, the cost of the increase in the uh, of rebidding as well as the cost of what I just identified would likely have taken up probably about four to six million dollars of that grant. So we really wouldn't have changed anything associated with the assessment area for that area. So the pros, uh, I, and you know, when you're talking about a $200 million project, your grants need to be fairly large to have a material impact on your, on your program. So the pros associated with the ARPA is that communi communities can decide where to allocate the funding, the, no application project was, process was required, and there was no matching funds that were required associated with it. The use, of, again, must comply with any of the program requirements. <coughs> And of course, the federal requirements of Davis-Bacon and any form of BABA uh, may apply associated with that grant. In addition, you have Section 319H grants. Uh, this is specifically to reduce non-point uh, source pollution, i.e. runoff, any precipitation, drainage, et cetera. This is more of a stormwater type grant than it is a, uh, an irrigation, sewer, or uh, water grant. Uh, it's very limited funding. It's a very small number that's available throughout all 67 counties. Right now, the, uh, for the most recent year, it was $6 million. Generally, they put about 5 to $11 million for the entire state. Uh, the average grant award for the most recent, uh, for the most recent awards was $300,000. Uh, when you're looking at our $24, $20 million stormwater project, if we had received any funding, it probably would have exceeded. Uh, the cost of, of actually um, managing the grant itself. And this is, uh, it does fund septic to sewer projects. Uh, it, uh, the federal funding requirements will apply because the Section 319H is a federal funding grant. But it is fairly small, and it's usually small, used, used by many communities for very small projects. 
We also have the Protecting Florida Together Wastewater Grant Program. Uh, I think you'll probably remember uh, or recall uh, they just announced all of these grants, $240 million that the governor announced that he awarded uh, throughout the state of Florida. Uh, these, again, are the grants that are associated with the BMAP area. And so for us, uh, having applied, if we had applied for this, it's unlikely we would have received any because there would have been no funds that have been, we weren't in a BMAP area associated with North 1 West. We will apply for this grant next year. Uh, as we get ready for shovel ready project with North One East. We also have the state revolving loan program. We've used that here in the past. Matter of fact, all of North Two and I believe Southwest Six Seven was funded uh, through the uh, stormwater, uh, the, the SRF program, the state revolving phone uh, program. Now, when North 2 was coming around and 6, 7 was coming around, you were in the depth of the, the, the recession, and there wasn't a lot of projects going on in the state of Florida, and so there, was, there, there had been built up a lot of money uh, associated with the SRF program. Today, that is no longer the case. In fact, there's a block grant that generally comes down from the, from the feds annually for the SRF program. When the, when the feds uh, approved the Infrastructure uh, Act, they replaced the SRF funding with the infrastructure money, money so there was no add-on to the SRF program like you would, what we were expecting. And so in speaking with SRF about that matter, you know, they had, they had told us basically that the feds had, feds had just simply flipped the money and said they're gonna utilize the SRF for something else and then the infrastructure would just take the place. <laughs> Today, there's basically a $20 million cap, cap on both programs, and it's very competitive throughout the state of Florida. Many people are using it right now. With the additional funding that's coming in from the state for doing some of those non-point source uh, projects for septic to sewer, they're also utilizing, uh, to the extent that they can, the SRF program. Again, when you're talking about an annual basis for up to $20 million, and if we were to get some number less than this, then we would still be borrowing the majority of the money in order to do these projects anyways. So we didn't apply for SRF this year because it basically it wasn't, a, it wasn't competitive and it, wasn't, uh, it probably would not have been cost effective for us to do that portion or any portion of the project with SRF. In addition, you have the WIFIA pro, uh, loan program. Now the WIFIA loan program is limited insofar as uh, it's, it is a federal credit program. It is not a grant, it is a loan. It is a loan that uh, at a maximum of 49% of your project, and generally they do these for very large projects. I'm talking, and, and uh, so if you're out there building a water plant or you're building a new uh, uh, wastewater plant, you would look at WIFIA funding uh, in order to support a low interest loan uh, through the federal government. It's a very long, arduous process to get to a WIFIA grant or a WIFIA loan. Number one, you have to start out with a letter of interest and require six months to prepare it and, you know, and all the supporting documentation, et cetera, et cetera. It goes to the feds. You usually have to pay an application fee in order to apply for it. Again, the funding is limited to 49% of the overall project. 51% still needs to come from somewhere else. There's also a credit processing fee due at the execution of any loan that you might take. 80% uh, of the maximum total amount of the, of, of the entire project can only, can only can be federal funding uh, if the WIFI is involved with it. It also requires that your project be shovel ready. Again, we've talked about the shovel ready portion, so you need to be shovel ready before you get anything. 12 to 18 months after applying is when you get the funding. So because 12 to 18 months afterwards, you usually have to float a, um, uh, a bridge loan in order to be able to get these funds after the fact. And probably the most, one of the more, more important part is, is that there's an increased uh, environmental review associated with this. In other words, the National Environment Policy Act requires a review of this uh, interest would be market rate generally, and it generally has been about 1% higher than the SRF loans. So again, you know, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act just shows that there's a heck of a lot of money out there. 
Much of it we don't really, we don't qualify for, but we will make every effort to apply for if we do qualify for it. It does repla it, it replace the funding previous allocated to the SRF program. The Infrastructure and Job Act actually funds everything over a five-year period, so there's like 1 20th or 20% every single year applicable to the program until it's done. So another uh, item that you've heard of, actually you approved it here recently in Resolution 32-23, we've requested $10 million for the utility program uh, with respect to the, uh, the, most, the upcoming uh, budget process for the state of Florida. And so this would be a direct appropriation from the, from the state. Uh, we have, in fact, made a direct appropriation and have received a direct appropriation from the federal government. We just received that recently. Uh, and this was primarily as a result of the changes at the, at the, uh, at the federal, federal level to where they're allowing for uh, application of additional funding through, their, through the budget process, something that had ended for about 12 to 15 years uh, before it was restarted again, I think a couple of years ago. So I don't know whether that's going to continue in the future or not to where there might be additional funding that's available for us. Uh, direct funding from the federal government, but right now it's working at the, at the state level and we have applied for $10 million associated with that program for the septic to sewer conversion program. In addition, there's an environmental justice grant program. In this particular case, it, uh, it's not for construction activities, but it allows us to do a great deal of research, investigations, et cetera, uh, you know, regarding the environment and the elimination of pollution. In addition, the framework for freedom budget that was just announced by the governor uh, included in that, uh, there's approximately $60 million available for the entire state for qualifying funding items that are associated with alternative water supply, as well as the water quality enhancement and accountability program. So as these are available to us, uh, and if, they, you know, if these get through the entire budget process and they'll be budgeted or the budget will be approved somewhere around June, and they actually manage to last through the entire program uh, and are included in the budget, then we will apply for what's available to us to the extent that we can. So in closing, and I realize this has been a little long, I, I, think, it's, I think it's clear as you've watched what we've done, and again, I do have experts here that if you want to talk to them about the same thing, uh, that we are limited in what we can get here in the, st in the city. It's not that we haven't been out looking for things, it's just that we're limited in what we can achieve uh, with regard to grants and the UEP. South Florida Water Management District, reclaimed water alternative supply is something that, you know, we focus our efforts with and we've been very successful with South Florida Water Management District over the years. FDEP, the septic to sewer system, as long as it's within the BMAP areas uh, and that are available to us, we'll certainly apply for it. Uh, and, if it's, and if it's not, we'll still apply for it, and if we don't get it, we don't get it. BMAP, Northeast 1 UEP, we will certainly be applying for it uh, within the contract area of 7 and 11 and a portion of both of those. And of course, uh, catch basin replacement, of course, this is all stormwater related, but at the same time, it's available to us and we need to make it, and, uh, and we will certainly apply for those funds every year uh, that they're available to us. And of course, we have the direct appropriation. So these are the things that we focus on when it comes to the UEP. This is what's available to us. There's nothing, there's, uh, there really is nothing beyond any of these uh, programs. And there hasn't been anything that's being, you know, that's associated with these programs. As a matter of fact, much of the septic to sewer program wasn't available five years ago. And so it is something that the state has taken on in order to clean up its own water, uh, uh, water bodies within the state and, uh, and, have, and so we're, we'll take advantage of what we can take advantage of when the time comes to take advantage of them. So we're always constantly looking for opportunities to obtain funding for the UEP. I think that should be clear from what we've talked about here today and I don't want anybody to walk away from here that we haven't been. Uh, we're always seeking opportunities when they're available to us uh, and they meet the project criteria. So thank you. Sorry it was so long, and I realize it was, but I thought it was important that we get this out uh, for everybody to understand what we've done with regard to grants in the UEP. 
Thank you. I'll get ready to open the floor. But before I do that, Mr. Mason, if you could uh, reiterate exactly what the definition uh, that you think shovel ready means. You know, is that just the design has been completed? So I just want to make sure we got a clear understanding of that because I think it's very uh, important with a lot of these uh, different grants that are, that are out there. I do have an answer for that. Hold on a second. <laughs> I actually wrote it down. <clears throat> So shovel ready means that the design is done and you're ready to contract and you're ready to turn dirt. So either you already have a contract in place and you're ready to turn dirt or the design has been completed and you're ready to go out and contract for the work. So that's what basically what shovel ready means. So I would take that as the design has been completed and we have either already issued an RFP uh, or... Or we we're are beginning ready to issue one. Or we are beginning to issue an RFP. Yes. Okay. Council Member Steinke. Thank you. Um, Mark, I want to personally thank you for taking the time uh, to go through and put together a presentation as detailed as, as you have. These guys helped with it, and I want to make so sure that they Thank you are, to everyone all, involved with it. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important it. that, that we understand uh, as a council that all efforts are being taken uh, to minimize the impact uh, on our citizens as we uh, continue to expand the utilities available uh, to them. Uh, and uh, for us to know and for the citizens to know that this type of uh, work uh, almost ad nauseum in an effort to find as much money as, possibly, as we possibly can before their dollars go to work uh, to bring those utilities to them. I, I highly appreciate the work that you've done and the way that you've explained it. Thank you. Yeah, again, I'll reiterate that as well. I appreciate the uh, presentation and all the detailed information that everyone has provided, but I do have just a couple uh, either comments or questions. Um, you know, I think uh, over the last five years I've been sitting here, I know one of the uh, common themes when, it, when we discuss UEP has always been, you know, if we're working on this project now, um, when do we prepare for the next one? And as we've heard here today, a lot of these grant opportunities, at least the design has to be completed. Um, now, with uh, North One, East and West, both of those uh, projects uh, complete as far as the design aspect, Mr. Klingon? North One is complete. North One West is complete. We're in the process of North One oh, East, 80, right? 80% right now. Okay. For North One East. And the reason that I ask that is because we have to make sure that, you know, we look to the future um, to see what's available for any type of federal dollars or state dollars out there. So I think it's very important for us to be proactive. Um, I, I personally believe uh, once we're done with North One, East and West, then we are looking to the next phase uh, and start that design. Of course, we don't, we don't know what type of uh, grant opportunities will be out there until we get there, but we know we probably are going to need the design completed. So I think that, uh, you know, we need to be proactive uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we take advantage of anything that may be out there at the time. Um, the comment made about the different types of uh, uh, federal requirements, I know with the uh, federal government, I've been on a couple of federal jobs myself, uh, on a smaller scale. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of requirements uh, that come along with that. Uh, but one thing that I think that we need to, to look at is, is it still going to be an advantage for us as a city and our residents? Because even though we go out to bid, uh, and we're trying to get some federal dollars, the contractors, you know, they have to pay a certain uh, fee uh, to their labor, you know, uh, products have to be bought here in the United States. Uh, that's all well and good because uh, the grant may offset the additional expense that we're going to have. So I think that's very important uh, to mention as well. And of course, we, we would have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I would like, uh, as Mr. Uh, I can't read my own writing, um, the gentleman that we've used for the last 30 years um, as far as... Uh, Mark Brewer. Brewer, that's it. 
Yeah, I just had a quick question for him. Sure. Uh, it sounds like you've been in this uh, field for uh, a long Since period a of time boy. here. I'm just I guess my question to you is, um, is there anything that we should be doing, in your opinion, as a city moving well, forward? Do you have any recommendations for us looking, looking to the future? Sure. And some of those the city already does. Um, when we talk about the continuum of, of a project, the, the point we like to learn about the project is what I call the paper napkin stage when you're just thinking about it. Because what happens is as you, as you flow through the, the project, the, the process of even through design, inflexibilities and schedule constraints begin to limit your opportunities. So what we try to do, and we've worked with Tetra Tech for a long time to do this on, on many projects, is identify fundable elements of projects and make sure that if, uh, like for instance, we talked about the catch basins. I'm not an engineer, so I would have to rely on them, but essentially some things can be modified because that inflexibility or those decisions haven't already been made. So I think that number one is always look at the opportunities throughout the entire process because from year to year different programs come and go some of them they just change the name some of them they actually have different um, desires to put their money behind and so we are on top of that on a regular basis that's that's what we do and so our job is and i believe our mission is to help projects come in at the lowest total cost of delivery. So when we evaluate a grant or a funding opportunity, we're not just looking at, oh, that's half a million dollars or that's $20 million. There's a lot of times the interim uh, requirements are um, need to be evaluated, but there are also sometimes reporting requirements well into the future, like in economic development projects, things like that those requirements can go on for a decade. And so the cost of the entire process is what we evaluate beginning at the beginning and try to drive that. The other thing is, is that, and I've encouraged hundreds of communities to do this, um, and to date nobody's wanted to do it, but it's my recommendation that rather than wonder what the market is going to do when it comes to a bid is to use a bid alternate without the requirements to actually determine what the real cost is. And so the, the importance there is being able to say in the marketplace that it's not something we just dreamt up or did a, uh, a cost estimate. In fact, getting responses from your bidders saying with the requirements, this is the cost. Without the requirements, this is the cost. Here's the, here's the really important thing. For in the past, Buy American, Buy America, American Iron and Steel, there's been different flavors. BABA is all of that on steroids, in my opinion, the new Build America, Buy American. If we can prove that the cost escalation for materials, so we'd have to have a, a bid alternate to prove that, is more than 25% of the cost of non-domestic materials, we can apply for a waiver. And with that documentation that wasn't just, oh, it's gonna be more money. In fact, being able to prove that would, uh, m you could actually waive the requirements completely. And that could change the entire makeup of whether that cost or that uh, that grant opportunity is legitimate or not. I mean, if you think on average, uh, I've had suppliers tell me, "Oh, th those getting that non-domestic or uh, getting that domestic is going to be forty percent more." And I said, "Fine, prove it. Send me send me your price list." Yet has anybody sent it to me? But I'm hoping for the day. <laughs> that we can actually prove it in the marketplace and be able to go back and say, we wanna waive those requirements. I'm all about Buy American, don't get me wrong. I think you know, all of our stuff around flexibility and availability and not having cost escalations. I mean, the market has changed in the last couple of years 
so dramatically that by the time a cost estimate is done, it's wrong. So we're trying to find ways to, without really doing a lot of extra work, find that answer so that we can prove out that it's real. Um, Davis Bacon, honestly, most of the time, the, um, the additional cost is in contractor administration. And I'll just say this publicly, whining on their part to do the paperwork because they love to build stuff and get paid. They hate paperwork and we try to help them kind of make that easier. But, and then on the other side, it does cost money for the city to monitor that. But it's a, it's a fraction, it's not even a fraction of a percent of the cost. Generally speaking, if you talk to any contractor, because I talk to them on a very regular basis, if they're not paying more than the prevailing wages right now, people are not showing up. So where it was, and it was, and in fact, um, we tested the theory here at the Everest plant many years ago. Um, the Department of Labor had established rates where everything below I-4 was aggregated <coughs> And so the union rates on the other side of the state were actually applied over here. And we helped make the case to the Department of Labor on behalf of the city of Cape Coral that that was not legitimate for the prevailing rate in this area. And that was approved to be able to use that. So those are the things that it's okay to test the system, but you have to have real information. And I do think that by and large, um, the, the city's ability and the folks that we work with that work for the city that are involved with grants is very high caliber compared to most of the communities we have. We're not, we don't file every application that gets filed. We only fill the gaps where we can bring our expertise that doesn't already exist. So probably I would say very few of the applications that get filed are done by us, but we do help you know, point and direct and, you know, we do the applications when, when we're asked to, but um, the city has a lot of capabilities in their staff and um, it's actually refreshing that when you talk to certain folks, they know what you're talking about instead of coming from left field somewhere. Um, so I do think, time back to your question is, I think start early and be continuous in looking at the entire process and before those inflexibilities and schedule constraints come into play, try to drive the projects towards eligible activities, if that makes sense. Um, always look at total cost of delivery and bringing that down to the absolute minimum and going through the process of identifying actual market information so that you can know what you're up against, really get the true cost, and file a waiver if it's, if it's valid, and get those things waived so you're not paying additional, exceptionally high additional costs. Thank you very much Thank you. for your input. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. With the advice that you just given us um, this morning, and thank you, by the way, have you given the same advice to Mark, and did they reach out to you during these projects in the early on uh, right. to seek uh, what type of fundings were available and, and how to go about this? Right. We have done that with this project. Obviously, we're not, we're not actually contracted directly with the city to do more of an umbrella like we did in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, but we're very focused on um, N1 because that's the team we're on. But yes, we talk about that. We've had a number of meetings about how to do that, um, not just with the city staff, but also the engineers to make sure that all of those things are looked at. And with that being said, um, basically, like you said, start early and be continuous. Um, Were you approached to file for these grants at this time to see what monies were available? When you say at this time? Uh, with this UEP project that we're moving forward with. Yeah, so I, I don't, I uh, apologize, I don't have the exact date that our contract was signed, but it was more than a year and a half ago, and that's when this process, one of the, one of the items 
was to seek out and find and provide recommendations, and that's actually been going on for over a year and a half. And that part of that uh, effort, we did participate and help with the application that's been funded um, under the Water Management District and also participated in other ones as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, any other uh, comments? Council Member uh, Hayden. Mark, one thing you didn't touch on mm -hmm. was the um, $1 trillion infrastructure bill the president signed last November. Sure. Um, and noted in that is also shovel worthy or shovel ready projects. You know, talked about upgrades and roads, and there was a section in there and more. Mm -hmm. um, any of that, and I know we don't know yet what may be coming to the state, what may be coming to the city, but are we eligible for any of that money for this particular project? So the um, for this project, he's talking about this project specifically. Okay, for for this project specifically, back up to the IIJA, um, <coughs> there were actually 389 elements of funding included in that bill, and I've un had the unfortunate experience to read every one of them, and um, and so pr by and large, the money that the city is eligible for has is going through what I call the existing financial infrastructure, like the SRF program. And, and like Mark said, there was a, what I call the big, big print giveth. And then later on when nobody was watching, the low print taketh away. And so the net effect to the state for like the SRF program, a large portion of where you talk, where it talks about drinking water or wastewater, yes, there was money in there, but you know, the, the news said $15 billion. And then it was divided by five and then undercut through the normal. Normally, the SRF program receives $3 billion every year, has for many, many years. It's no longer receiving that $3 billion. And so, I you know, probably shouldn't say this, but um, it sounded great. But what in fact happened was no no demonstrative net change to the availability. And um, honestly, a number of those things were procurement actions under the 389. They were things they were gonna do anyway that were procurement actions that were then funded because there wasn't already money for it. Um, I'm happy to send you the entire thing, but um, honestly, unless you need a cure for insomnia, don't bother. <laughs> So the answer um, is no. So the answer <laughs> is it didn't significantly change any eligibility for this project for the city. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank, thank everyone for uh, the presentation and the information. It was uh, very informative, Mr. City Manager. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, just, I just wanted to mention... <clears throat> I had the pleasure, I think, of meeting with most of you yesterday, um, not with all of you. There are still a couple that I still need to speak with, but I, I seem to get the, the overall impression from a majority of you that uh, the city's ability to, to write grants and be in the application process uh, is something that's of high importance to you all. Um, I know that we have dedicated positions in the police and fire department, and so I'm going to be working with staff to see how we may be able to uh, replicate that type of process for our infrastructure departments such as uh, utilities, public works, and the capital improvement office. And um, based on where we go with that, you, you might see something in the, the budget amendment coming forward. Thank you. I, I will mention that uh, a couple years ago, uh, about two years ago, if I recall correctly, there was a uh, budget item uh, for a position you know, for a grant writer here in the city, but for whatever reason, that, that particular uh, position was filled. Um, you know, if you look at the uh, police and fire grant writers, uh, that, that is definitely a proven uh, formula. You know, what, what it actually costs for that individual and the return on investment that we get is huge. Uh, so I think probably all of us are, uh, you, you know, anytime we can get a great return on investment, we want to we want to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity. 
I think uh, before we get started, it's 1030. Why don't we just take a 10 minute recess? We'll start back up at 1040.
program that's passed down through uh, the state of Florida and then down through Lee County uh, is how this, this process gets disseminated. So uh, we've got uh, Alvin Henderson, our emergency management division manager, and Kirsten Lynch, uh, the fire department grant coordinator writer, along with uh, other city staff and a uh, number of folks from consultant firms from uh, around the country that are here that are experts in this field to help walk us through this. Um, so it's gonna take a little bit of time, but our goal is to walk you through each of the projects. You, you have an awareness of what those projects are um, and uh, other things to get you involved in this uh, process as we pr begin to uh, move through a, this hazard mitigation grant process is at the very beginning right now. Um, so this is an opportunity to get some feedback from uh, our, our council on some of those projects. And instead of just coming to you with a blank slate, we've got a number of projects that have been developed across uh, our different departments. Just wanna reiterate that mitigation is not repair for her, from Hurricane Ian. Mitigation is about hardening and, and making our city more resilient for future disasters. So this is separate from Hurricane uh, Ian repairs. Also through this process, I've never been through one of these or seen any community get every one of their um, requests that gets placed in there. We rank them uh, at the county and Alvin sits on that board. Um, so they're ranked and so generally they kind of start at the top and work their way down until they run out of money. And so there's a, a whole bunch of information we'd like to get through uh, and there's a bunch of projects. So I, I don't want to get kind of squirreled off into one area. So I'd ask you if we can, we'll get through all of them and then we'll come back through and, and hit questions. But obviously if you have something along the way, please let us know. Alvin. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, what we wanna to try to accomplish here uh, during the next couple slides is kind of give you an overview of uh, where we're at today since Ian uh, impacted us here in the city of Cape Coral. Uh, specifically talk about the hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, I apologize in advance if I throw out the acronym HMGP. I'll try not to do that, but it's a, a casualty of being in emergency management, I guess, for such a long period of time you start using acronyms. Uh, we'll talk about the process that was utilized thus far, and then important as well is the process moving forward, how we'll advance, and we'll talk about some of those milestones uh, throughout the next couple slides and then talk about the projects themselves uh, from a high level perspective, and then what next steps we need to take uh, to maintain the aggressive schedule that we've put together uh, with the county, and then also with our contracted consultants as well. And then also other potential grant programs. Uh, Kirsten Lynch, the fire department's uh, grant manager, grants coordinator, uh, I, I like to re refer to her as like a gold prospector. Uh, what she typically does with those grant opportunities is really you know, the same as what a prospector does trying to find gold. You dig through mountains of dirt, rocks, stones down and sift through it and try to get to a flake of gold, put all those flakes together as a, a funding st uh, stream for a business. That's pretty much what uh, Kirsten does from the grants perspective. There's, a mountain of paperwork to go through to really find out what grants are applicable, when they open up and when we can go after them. And that's one of the processes that she does uh, with the assistance of our emergency management staff and with our contracted consultants as well. So what is hazard mitigation grant program? Basically hazard mitigation, like the chief said, it's a process that we look at within emergency management to try to lessen the impacts of future disasters on our community. So what we're looking at is ways that we can lessen that impact, recover from it sooner, more efficiently, and make ultimately our, our city and our community more resilient. Uh, some of those typical projects that you uh, utilize under this type of grant program are wind retrofits, flood control uh, measures, uh, transportation system retrofits, protection of utilities, critical infrastructures, uh, generators, uh, building code enforcement. Those are areas that we look at that are time consuming, but as a result, lessen those impacts of disasters on our community. Uh, some actual project examples that have been successful in this uh, grant program in the past has been generators and wind retrofitting or uh, hardening, if you will, of a structure. Uh, utility redundancies where you might have a secondary uh, utility feed coming into an area or secondary uh, water, uh, potable water supply to critical infrastructure. 
safe rooms are another large area that get funded out of this area that uh, provide shelter for critical workers, for example, uh, to actually be able to hunker down, if you will, during the high force winds of a hurricane, for example, and then as soon as those winds subside, they're already on site and they go immediately into action and start responding uh, and recovering from the impacts of that storm. So again, like the chief said, mitigation is a long-term harding. We're not just looking at Hurricane Ian repairs. What outcomes are we trying to look at from this hazard mitigation grant program? It's an increased level of protection to our community. That's the people, the structures, and the infrastructure that make up our community. Uh, one requirement that we have to look at is that these projects have to be cost effective. FEMA has a benefit cost analysis methodology that they utilize in uh, qualifying the projects and scoring them. And that's one of the uh, processes that we follow uh, within the Lee County Disaster Advisory uh, Council as well. Uh, the solution has to be a long-term solution. It's not a temporary measure, if you will. It's uh, trying to break that, that chain of impact to our community again. So these are projects that are a long-term solution to these issues that we're identifying. Uh, before we get into the, the funding and grant uh, uh, timeline that you see on the screen, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we prepared for this. Back in 2021, we put together a uh, contract to have consultants uh, be under contract with us to work with us in planning efforts on our plans that we have in place, uh, making sure that they're up to date and most effective also to assist us in response to these situations, for example, like the hurricane that we experienced, to have them come in, work with us, and then also at the same time start looking at recovery so we can be extremely efficient in trying to recover from the impacts and then also look at financially how we can get every possible dollar possible to us to be able to keep the, uh, the city economically advanced in that process. Uh, and for example, with that, uh, Ms. Shirley Lenton from Haggerty, uh, who's one of the contract consultants, she bedded in with us uh, during that hurricane response phase. That Tuesday morning when we were all coming together into the emergency operations center, she came right in with us. So she was there from you know, the very start or time zero, if you will, of the hurricane landfall and is still with us today. Same with Ruben from Tetra Tech. Uh, so the contract has been very valuable for us to be able to respond to this type of situation and then look at a efficient recovery and then also look at every possible dollar that is out there that we could get our hands on and bring into the city. So a little bit from what we have done since landfall, uh, right after we got done with the initial response to the hurricane, uh, we convened a meeting with all city departments to have a training session with all the directors and the recovery team that was identified, which that recovery team was a member of each city department that makes up our recovery team, along with all of our emergency management division staff. So we had a uh, training on the HMGP process, what type of projects typically get funded, and what type of process is involved with these projects so we could be very effective and efficient with these projects and getting them identified, put together, and then submitted over to the county. Uh, through that process then, all those projects, and we'll uh, touch on them here shortly, they were then vetted out through the emergency management staff and our contracted consultants to make sure that they were applicable to the hazard mitigation grant program. And once they were determined uh, to be eligible, we then put them on our LMS or our local mitigation strategy list over to Lee County. So that process was basically started back in October all the way up through February, and we'll get to a slide that takes us from February to where we're at today and going into the future. But the point I'm trying to make is the fact that this was a very aggressive process. We did not sit back and wait. Uh, we were going after money right from day zero of landfall of Hurricane Ian. And that's really what this slide is starting to show us here in the top where you see the uh, FEMA IA for individual assistance and FEMA PA for public assistance emergency work. That process was put in the day of landfall. 
Uh, that's where our contract consultants started working on project worksheets, uh, looking at emergency work, and then also uh, kind of consulting to all the department directors to be mindful of we wanted to do emergency work, try not to get into permanent work because, again, we're trying to take advantage of every dollar possible from the federal government to have reimbursement over to the city. That reimbursement word is a key word. Those uh, grants or those programs are reimbursable programs, meaning that we have to expend the funds and then we get reimbursed from them. And we have been doing a pretty good job of capturing that work. Uh, we've already had accelerated uh, project payments come in uh, to the city uh, that I know that uh, Mr. Mason reported out in last council meeting on. Uh, so those have been going on since day zero of landfall of Hurricane Ian. Also, part of that is having a disaster recovery center in place to start capturing information from uh, community members and the business community on the impact and losses that they suffered from the hurricane. Our disaster recovery center, by the way, uh, still remains uh, either the second or third busiest DRC in the state of Florida. So a lot of people are still taking advantage of the resources that we have put together at Lake Kennedy Center. Center. The next phase that we just start getting under now is the hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, what occurs is during that first zero to three months that you see in that timeline, the individual assistance, the public assistance information and information gathered at the disaster recovery center is then brought in to the Florida Division of Emergency Management, reported up to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, that then is provided to the president. The HMGP program then gets funded based on collectively how big the disaster is, the dollar amount of damage. So that's the process that goes on at FEMA in Washington, D.C. to look at those expenditures or, or the impacts, if you will, from the disaster which then they look at what that appropriation is going to be uh, coming out under the HMGP program. That next process that we're waiting for is what's called the notice of funding opportunity. So after all that information is uh, brought together, a dollar amount is identified and then reported down to the county. Once we get that, then we look at the next process of those projects and scoring those projects and moving forward with project submittal and we'll get a little bit more into that here shortly. But then other areas of opportunity, if you will, for funding, uh, obviously is through the Hazard Mit Mitigation Assistance Grant Program, Flood Mitigation Assistance, and the Building Resilient Infrastructures and Communities. Those grants are then available based on that funding uh, opportunity, and then also through uh, the HUD Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program as well. At the bottom, you see other grants. Uh, again, these aren't automatically turned on with a disaster declaration. They have to be uh, funded, if you will, through Congress, and then that information will come out to us through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, reporting down through Florida Division of Emergency Management to the counties. <clears throat> so where are we at today? Uh, like I said, basically, we worked through all city departments to build up our potential projects list that would be applicable under the hazard mitigation grant program process. On February 13th, the Disaster Advisory Council for Lee County met. We went through all the projects submitted to Lee County uh, based on the community uh, impact and uh, importance of those projects. There is a scoring rubric that is put together uh, to start scoring those projects, to start prioritizing those uh, projects into a list. Then that list is then forwarded over to Florida Division of Emergency Management. They look at that list and then they come back with any recommendations of either yes, fully applicable to the HMGP program, maybe that might have to have some uh, update of information or wordsmithing into a certain program area to make it uh, applicable, or no, it does not meet the intent of the the grant application process. We have that list uh, already back from FDEM. So now what we're doing is basically in a hold pattern, if you will, we are waiting for the next step, which is in now the hands of the president uh, to issue th down through FEMA would be the notice of funding opportunity. 
that will then allow us to understand the dollar value, if you will, of what Lee County can expect. Uh, that then also allows the Disaster Advisory Council to meet and say, okay, we have X amount of dollars uh, potentially coming in under a tier one or first phase funding, if you will, and then prioritize those projects for submittal up to FDEM. Now, when those projects go up to FDEM, what they're going to be looking at is the technical feasibility, environmental soundness, cost effectiveness, and flood main, floodplain management compliance. So as they go through that process, it's going through another level of scrutiny uh, to make sure that we are utilizing those funds in the most effective means and by what is the governance of the HMGP statute process. Uh, the next phase after that would be applications are due. Typically right now it was May, kind of concerns us, you know, we're almost into March. We have not seen that notice of funding opportunity come out yet. That will be the next hurdle that we would have to go through. And then you see after that, the second line takes us through floor division emergency management, reviewing those projects, requesting any additional information they may need to approve those projects as applicable to forward them on to FEMA. Uh, the first estimated start of FEMA award letters is anticipated somewhere between April, June of 2024. And then the request uh, council approval for funded projects where we'll be coming back to you all will probably most likely be sometime in that July, August 2024 timeframe. Again, that second row uh, is very wide open to actual dates. It's all still going to depend upon once the notice of funding opportunity is issued, and then when they tell us the first round of applications are due at the Florida Division of Emergency Management. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Kirsten Lynch, our uh, grants manager, uh, where she could go a little bit more into detail about the summary of our projects that we have identified as meeting uh, the requirements of the hazard mitigation grant program process. Kirsten. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. Um, I'm going to piggyback on what Alvin said. If at any time I throw out acronyms, I apologize. <laughs> I will try to slow down and correct myself, but we live in that world, so sometimes it will happen. Um, also, to what Alvin has said, this has been a very long process. We started immediately after the storm, myself, Haggerty, and Tetra Tech getting together with the subject matter experts in each department to come up with proposals and plans and direction to move forward with these projects. And as you can see, um, our summary of projects here, these aren't located out by department. I will move on to that in the next slide. Um, but this just gives the general that we have um, 33 potential projects, um, one of them being a drainage project, two generator projects, uh, acquisition projects, relocations, um, safe rooms, I will go into detail on what some of these are moving forward, just kind of giving you the overview. These are based on FEMA's um, criteria categories, uh, elevation and retrofitting, uh, wind retrofits, and then there's miscellaneous projects, which include communication projects, um, IT, uh, master plans, assessments, um, beach renourishment that don't really fit into a box, but they're technically considered eligible for this grant. So I'm going to not bore you <laughs> with all of the details, um, but I will let you know that we have subject matter experts from each department here if you do have any specific questions regarding the projects themselves. I will kind of give you um, an overview of what they are, and if you have any questions, you can absolutely follow up afterwards. Um, for the capital improvements um, division of the city, their three projects consist of standalone safe rooms, which would be located strategically throughout the city. And again, what Alvin said, are those are basically for our next up employees that they may not be in an activation, but we need them, be it our road clearing crews, um, utilities workers, um, PD, those uh, essential employees that may not need a space in the EOC for activation, but we need them here in the city to help assist with response immediately following a storm. So those would be located um, three standalones. When I get into utilities and the fire department, there are also more, but these would be citywide for city employees for sheltering purposes 
um, in a storm. Uh, also, one of the, uh, since I've been the grant writer for the fire department, has been a high priority for the city, which is the hardening of City Hall and updating, upgrading the generator there. The generator is as old as the building. Um, we saw that it wasn't substantial enough to be able to move the folks back in there to do their daily jobs after the storm. We had, you know, big fans in there and multi limited uh, staff. So to be able to harden that facility, um, put some sort of wind curtain, cushion, upgraded glass, uh, we have it at about $10 million, so it would give us a good start in getting that building um, sustainable during a storm. Um, it's a very, very high priority project uh, for the city. And then uh, also we would be hardening and adding generators to the Lake Kennedy Senior Center and um, Special Populations Building, which again were utilized heavily immediately following the storm for city employees, resources, uh, the DRC is still there. I mean, it, they're critical facilities in the sense that um, they're able to be utilized um, for kind of the ancillary uh, projects the city has going on after a storm. So moving on to fire, um, we have the hardening of fire station six, which again is the um, upgrade of the generator to have more capacity and um, hurricane proofing any windows or doors that's there, any additional wind retrofitting hardening to make that a more sustainable structure for our first responders. Um, the, we have two uh, relocation slash construction elevation projects, which is Fire Station 10 and Fire Station 5. Um, as you all know, Fire Station 10 is uh, in a house right now and sustained heavy damage um, during Ian. So to be able to have them relocated to a safe, hardened structure in the Northeast Cape would be very beneficial for the fire department and our first responders. Um, station five also sustained heavy damage and that uh, particular station is prone to flooding um, on a normal day. Um, it, it's, I think our oldest station now as it stands, it's currently our oldest station. Um, it's got a lot of issues, so to be able to uh, relocate that or elevate it, depending on how uh, feasibility comes with, with that move. And where's Station 5 located? It's on Diplomat right now. Okay. And it would stay on Diplomat. It would stay in the same district. Okay. Um, and then another uh, safe room project would be the uh, Emergency Operations Center expansion. Um, as many of you saw, and we all saw during the storm, it was severely inadequate for the level of staffing that we have in the city right now and the growth that we're moving towards. Um, a safe room is basically uh, a component of FEMA where they tell you you have to have this many square foot per people. So, and you have to have adequate shower facilities, locker facilities, dining facilities, like basically contains everything in that space um, for the duration, 36, 72 hours, whatever that may be. So that is, again, one of our high priority projects is just making that a more sustainable um, building for uh, the growth of the city to help the residents respond. Um, IT projects, um, I have them listed out separate, but because these are based on a benefit of cost analysis from FEMA, they will probably be combined with other projects to make a larger um, benefit to cost ratio. Um, for example, the uh, battery backup and data center, you'll see as I move towards PD, there's some hardening there. So this $200,000 would probably be lumped into the 3 million PD hardening to make it a more viable benefit um, project. Um, also, Wi-Fi coverage in city locations and then fiber connectivity to utilities. Uh, here's the PD project that I was referring to. It's the hardening of the building. Again, they have the same issue with the glass and leaking and roof issues. So this would be to um, upgrade that facility to be uh, more hardened. Um, 
public works projects, I definitely um, will give you the briefest of brief overviews <laughs> on these. Um, they're very detailed, very thought out. Thank you very much to the Public Works Department for all the uh, time they've put into helping us develop these. So I'm going to briefly just touch on them and then we can respond to them afterwards. So the first one um, falls into that miscellaneous category that sometimes um, HMDP doesn't necessarily fund studies and analysis and master plans, but they do set aside some money for flood assessments and different, different types of master planning that will help your city move forward. Like you might not be ready for construction right now, but they will give you the tools to assist you in that planning. So that's what that uh, particular line item is, is that assessment to where our flood prone areas are and give Public Works a better uh, idea of how to move forward. Um, the next project is the conversion of the 175 acres, um, formerly the golf course, which would be turned into a stormwater park to allow for better drainage in the South Cape. Um, again, I'm not intimately familiar with that entire process, but I'm sure that if, if there's more questions, we could uh, tackle that also. Um, the two-way communications um, hardening, again, would probably be something that we would try to roll into a larger package to make it more of a cost-benefit analysis uh, worthy project. Um, the hardening of Nicholas Annex it seems to be a common theme that we're working on with a lot of these projects, that these buildings are valuable assets to the city, but post-storm, it's very hard to get right back into them if they're not built and sustained to withstand any damage. So that's the concept behind the hardening of the Nicholas Annex would just to have public works uh, folks be able to work out of there, stay there and be safe. Um, fiber system for traffic signals um, possibly could be tied into another bigger project, but I believe that could be self-sustaining because that is quite an issue that the city saw after the storm. Um, beach renourishment at the Yacht Club and the uh, addition of a jetty. Um, upgrade to the stormwater master plan, again, that falls into that idea that it's potentially not a fundable HMGP project, but they will allocate money for studies and design um, and plans. Uh, moving on to utilities, there's um, several safe rooms because again we need utilities employees to be here on standby ready to go to fix whatever problems may have occurred during a storm so there are multiple safe rooms um, at utilities collection distribution um, this actually the second one is a total relocation and reconstruction of the south ro plant um, and then there is <laughs> and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that this one, the dedicated potable water main to Cape Coral Hospital. Um, as far as Cape Coral projects on the Lee County list, I believe this ranked number one from the county as a major priority to make sure that we're not in that situation where there is no water to a hospital. So that is, um, has been added to our list of projects as well. Um, the South RO um, emergency administration safe room, sorry, to be separate from the new uh, reverse osmosis building that was proposed in the previous project. Um, a safe room there as well as a safe room for the water production um, building as well. Um, more safe rooms, again, just to be able to have employees here, local, ready to respond immediately following a storm. So there's another safe room for water reclamation. Um, the biosolids building, um, and then if you move down to the next one, there's um, proposed 80 portable generators. Um, in the past, HMGP has frowned upon portable generators. Um, it's something that after Irma, we were able to um, secure a grant for a portable generator for the Faith Presbyterian Church, which the city owns the generator, and we were able to bring it there um, to allow that building to respond. So this would kind of be the same thing with utilities. We would hold on to these 80 generators and use them sporadically wherever needed throughout the city. Um, and again, it's, it's give or take with 
uh, FEMA and the state if they decide to fund portable generators, um, but we're putting it in there as a request. Um, another hardening of the South RO uh, is in there. A supplemental water source for critical facilities. Um, we all saw what happened um, when there was no running flushable <laughs> water. So just basically hardening those um, critical water structures that would allow us to be able to continue uh, with the response after. Um, relocation and construction of the Utilities Collection Distribution Building, apparently um, with all of that area being down very close to the river, um, it's not always the best suited location for some, um, especially the older buildings, so just looking to uh, relocate that and, and build that. Um, the large portable generators, these would be stationary, located at uh, critical lift stations throughout the city, um, so we don't lose power to those lift stations and in turn have uh, water issues. Um, and then the hardening of the Everest ble Bleach Building, uh, currently now as it stands, it's a screen building and they would like to modify it to a concrete structure that can withstand um, damage. Oops, one too many. So those were, again, just a brief, very brief overview of what myself and Haggerty and Tetra Tech have been working on with the departments um, to get us poised and ready for submission. The, of the 33 projects that are here, uh, to repeat kind of what Alvin was saying, not all of them will get funded. Um, but we will obviously do our best to um, combine like projects, add benefit to um, maybe some smaller projects to bulk them up um, and submit applications in the best interest um, of the city for city facilities. Now, Alvin is going to touch on the residential component of HMGP, and then I will circle back with our next steps and um, different. Thank you, Kirsten. As Kirsten was mentioning, part of the process of putting these projects together under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is to actually oversubmit, if you will. Uh, that's the guidance that our uh, contract consultants have provided to us, and then uh, also the direction that Florida Division of Emergency Management and the Federal Emergency Management Agency advises as well. Uh, so what we're trying to do is show a large need uh, which will hopefully equate to more dollars coming to us here in Lee County and then ultimately to us here in our city. Uh, so that's why we try to over uh, put in these projects to make sure that we're potentially maximizing our potential for that money to come in to us here in the city. Okay, uh, the last project area is residential uh, acquisitions and elevation projects. Uh, they are permissible under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Uh, typically, where these projects have been uh, awarded have been for uh, residential track block acquisitions of hazard-prone areas, uh, and then also elevation of structures to above known flood levels to prevent or reduce future losses. Uh, this is an area that uh, is very time-consuming, if you will, uh, a lot of times uh, there's the misconception this money would come immediately to the homeowners, uh, but that's not the case. As you see the timeline of, and this is an aggressive timeline as well, if we were to uh, go down this path, uh, we would have to do outreach to start looking at potential projects and homeowners that are in agreement uh, to either acquisition or elevation projects. Uh, we'd have to research that property, uh, look at what type of losses they occurred. Uh, again, these have to be scored based on a, a benefit cost analysis. Typically, those benefit cost analysis are looking at repetitive losses. Uh, and then there's the severe repetitive loss program that if you've had five losses within the last five years and that the losses have been over, uh, the 50% value of the assessed value of the home, that, that is then considered a severe repetitive loss. Uh, the base level of repetitive loss is uh, 
two or more losses that would equate to over 25% value of the assessed value of the home occurring within the last five years. Uh, so again, it's not looking at, at the one-off, if you will, uh, it's looking at repetitive loss type situations. Uh, continuing down the timeline, once we would do the research in sub-application development, we'd have to then submit that over to the Florida Division of Emergency Management for their review and uh, go through their process of looking at the environmental impact, uh, making sure of what the benefit cost analysis is, and then ultimately uh, how that looks at from a uh, community impact, if you will. <clears throat> After the state reviews, it goes also through the federal review. That process easily will take us through December of 2023. After that, grant award and state contracting uh, would start to occur. Uh, you're probably looking somewhere early would be September of this year, uh, but by September of 2024 is when those grant awards would start going out. The notice to the property owners and design development would then start as early as October of this year, but by October of 2024. The important takeaway from that is you cannot put a shovel in the ground until that date. So anything that you would do prior to that would basically make the project ineligible. So that's another key element of that. And then, so what does that mean to a homeowner is most likely the earliest that you could start on this project would be December of 2023, but definitely by December of 2025. That would be the timeline then that they could expect to be able to start on that type of project, whether it's acquisition or elevation. So the potential uh, project, what are we looking at? Best practices are typically ones that prioritize most at risk and vulnerable areas in the community, uh, most impacted by flood zones and properties that again have repetitive loss flooding. Again, that repetitive loss flooding is very important because that's the baseline for the uh, co benefit cost analysis that Florida Division of Emergency Management and the Federal Emergency Management Agency will utilize to basically grade the project. Uh, mitigate clustered pro properties and hol holistic approach to prevent emergency response and damage in large scale areas. Uh, again, we're, typically what gets funded if you're buying up or elevating an entire block of homes or an entire track of land, uh, the way FDEM or Florida Division of Emergency Management and the Federal Emergency Management Agency looks at it is they don't want checkerboarding approach. They look at a entire area. Uh, you'd also have to uh, perform general outreach for voluntary participation. One of the toughest areas that you start getting into with this uh, project area is value of home. Uh, and then also getting to that agreement level, which is then an agreement between the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the homeowner. And then uh, you wanna target owner-occupied structures as compared to rental or vacation homes. The primary residence has a higher benefit cost analysis associated to it versus uh, rental homes or vacation homes. Some of the challenges uh, that are typically experienced during this program or the cost, they're very large scale. Uh, it's expensive structures that would cost, be very costly to either acquire or to elevate. Uh, so again, that benefit cost analysis becomes a challenge then based on that fact. Uh, the timeline as we already went through is very extensive. Uh, in past, a lot of times homeowners are quick to say yes, they wanna be part of it but then when they start finding out that they're probably at least a year down the road before they could put shovel into ground, uh, that kind of is a uh, distract, distraction from the attractiveness of that program. Uh, also is the cost share component of it. Uh, the property owners would be responsible for 25% of the cost share to mitigate those structures. And then on properties that would be acquired, uh, we would then be responsible, we the city, be responsible for maintaining those properties in perpetuity and meaning that they would have to be green space. We would not be able to uh, develop those properties or put them out into the market for purchase at any type of later date. They would be green space maintained by the city in perpetuity. 
Next steps. Take you back to the residential properties here for a second. So um, this is something that we're looking for consensus on on council here at the end. Uh, do we want to progress um, with this? It sounds great at, at the surface of looking at ways that we can help our residents, um, whether it be you know lift their property. Um, but my recommendation, not to speak for our finance director, Mark Mason, but when we've looked at it, our recommendation is not to go that direction. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Again, as was mentioned, if you, uh, I don't think some of these properties are gonna qualify, but if you look down at the Yacht Club, talking about taking one house that might qualify and leveling it and it becomes green space for forever, you can't ever build vertically on it again. It comes off of our tax rolls. You're gonna have properties on either side of it potentially that are gonna remain. Um, so I don't think this really fits for Cape Coral. These acquisition properties are places where you have rivers that flood every year or every other year. Those are the ones, again, they wanna break this cycle of let's stop repairing these houses and do that. This is the once in a hundred year storm for Cape Coral, I hope, um, right? And so this is the, this really don't, doesn't really fit our model, I believe. And then as far as lifting, um, again, you're years away from seeing these, these projects come forward. It's gonna take an army of people to make that happen. If that is the direction of council, that is something we will certainly do, but it is not the, uh, gonna be our recommendation, but we'd love to get a consensus um, from council at the end of today's presentation. So moving on to the next steps in this grant process, uh, city staff at the department level uh, will continue to work with Haggerty and Tetratech to develop detailed scopes um, for submission of each individual project. Um, once those scopes are developed, uh, they will submit a uh, benefit cost analysis through the FEMA actually has a tool that you use. Um, they'll run every project through those and there's a certain score that you have to hit. I'm not knowledgeable of what the score is exactly off the top of my head, but if you need to know more uh, what goes into a benefit cost analysis, I can certainly have Haggerty or Tetra Tech touch on that. But it is a key component of these projects moving forward. Um, after the benefit of cost analysis and applications are submitted to DEM, we are in about a year holding pattern um, where they can come to us for additional uh, information and requests. Um, they can basically tell us at that point once we've submitted that our applications are not viable at all or they're viable if you do this, 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 and this. So there is a, basically a year of question and answering sessions. Um, and then uh, Alvin touched on this earlier, if we are awarded these projects, we will come back to you as a council for approval to accept the award. So you'll see all of this, all, <laughs> these successful projects come back to you for approval to accept um, funding and sign contracts. So that's moving on and again, probably not until summer of next year before we get to that phase. Um, cost share. Um, there is a 25% uh, cost share for the city for these projects. Um, we have indicated what uh, potential matches could be. Um, for example, in kind could be, um, I'll take the example of the Emergency Operations Center. If we were to move forward and be successful with that grant, we have a three year window to complete that project. You are not going to get design and construction and close out of a project done in three years. So what we would do now is go into um, getting a firm on board to design, and we would have to do these for multiple projects, uh, utilities projects, public works projects. We would have a design that we would start on currently now um, that if successful, that would be used as the match for this grant. So that's kind of what we meant by uh, in kind, and it also um, any land that the city owns, if we were to relocate a current facility to that facility, the land that we currently own is also considered a match. Um, there's also CDBGDR, I told you I apologize for acronyms, <laughs> uh, Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery. 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 Um, also offers a match that um, we've already submitted um, a request for direct allocation for CDBGDR funds. Whatever we receive, there is um, a component of a match to that for HMGP. It is the only, sorry, got really <laughs> intense there. It is the only grant you are actually allowed to use as a match for HMGP. That's one of their stipulations that you can't 
use multiple grants as your match for this grant. CDBGDR is one of the grants that we are allowed to use, um, and we will, I'm going to say, be very successful with that program as well. Um, Amy is the queen of that, and she knows uh, anything. If you have any additional questions and how that relates to HNDP, um, we certainly would uh, answer those for you. State appropriations, um, we are looking to get direct funding from the state um, for some of our projects um, that can also be used as a match. And then our last resort is to have to use um, city funds, uh, direct dollars for a match. And those would come from, if it's utilities, it would be utilities funds, stormwater, so on and so forth, general fund. Um, that is obviously our last resort. But if you're looking at a um, couple million dollar projects in this, you know, the city can come up with the 25, it basically makes it uh, wor a worthy project for the fraction of the cost that you're paying for it. But we would lo definitely look at local match as the last resort. Other grants um, that are related to the hurricane, again, I, I spoke to the Community uh, Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery, CDBGDR. Um, there's also the Flood Mitigation Assistance Grant, which is also through FEMA. Um, the Building Resilient Infrastructures and Community Grants, BRIC, that is a yearly funded nationally competitive grant that doesn't necessarily um, coincide with disaster. It funds the same types of projects. You still have to have a benefit cost analysis. Some of our projects that are um, worthy through HMGP, if we're not able to get funding through HMGP, when the BRIC cycle comes back around, which is um, November, we can apply again for those funds. Um, the Hurricane Housing Recovery Program is another uh, program that Amy um, runs, and those funds have already been allocated to the city. Um, and then there is the State Housing Initiative Partner Program, the SHIP, which are other um, hurricane-related grants that can help with our, to our residents. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Questions? So sorry we went heavy on details. Um, there's a there's a lot. Seems like there's a, a big desire to go through some of this, um, and there's literally books written on what qualifies um, for HMGP and the rules associated with that. Um, just of other note, when we talk about you know it goes through the the federal government, we still haven't got the notice of funding um, down to the state, what down to the county. When we get down to the county level, this is every municipality, um, every form of local government, um, whether special taxing districts, <coughs> the county themselves and also the state universities are all vying for that same pot of money. So with that, we'll stand by for any questions. Thank you. I know uh, one direction that you're looking from staff is the residential component uh, that you had mentioned. Maybe Mr. Uh, and you had mentioned Mr. Mason, maybe he can come up and make uh, a recommendation to council as well, as far as the financial component uh, of the information that you're asking for direction on. Yeah, we don't believe that it, uh, it will be cost effective for us to do residential projects today. Uh, primarily because the, uh, I think, uh, one of the criteria is multiple, uh, multiple disasters having hit that particular area or the, or the property itself. I think there was only four properties that had had uh, damage previously. And so we're talking about a limited number of projects or properties that would likely be impacted associated with this this program. Okay, thank you. Council Member Stein. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple questions in regard to the residential. If you're going <clears> to, <throat> if we're not going to support that, uh, just a couple things I'd like to understand. Um, the talk about it going into green space at a later date is, um, could you explain that? As I would kind of understand it, it's after the money was used to raise the property to a proper level, that after that property would change hands, then it would go to green space? Or is this just simply a using those funds to, if you will, demo the home, uh, at that point it would be green space? How does that work? So when we talk about residential projects, we're really talking about two different kind of major tiers here. One is elevation projects, so you would take a 
home built in the 1960s and pay to get it elevated to today's flood standard. Um, so that's project one. Um, project two would be uh, acquiring those projects and basically coming in, leveling that house, and that property now is no longer owned by that by that homeowner. It now comes as a part of the city of Cape Coral and heck, can have no vertical construction placed on it. So two different ways we can go, elevation projects and acquisition. So if we acquire it, then it gets bulldozed and it just becomes a vacant green lot that we have to all we can do is cut the grass on it essentially the other one is where it would we would help with that 25 percent match from that homeowner of getting it lifted um, but we can get into the details with some of our our Haggerty folks that we've worked up through about what it would take for those elevation projects uh, to come forward about getting it out getting it advertised making sure it's eligible it's cost benefit analysis hits the right score um, it's going to take a lot of people to manage those projects and there's some other options that are out there um, that can assist people that if they that's something they want to do thanks because certainly uh, like you mentioned this originally was meant for those homes along river banks that was you know, repetitive events um, those homes were constructed differently uh, than the homes are constructed here that that we would be addressing and what it takes to elevate a, a CBS home, you know, either on a stem wall construction or, or a monolithic slab construction is certainly different uh, than some of the homes that this was originally intended for. And with, uh, with, with that in mind, is this, is this an all or nothing project? And the reason why I ask it that way is uh, there are some homes that were dramatically affected um, uh, with the November 17th uh, change in uh, flood zones, uh, specifically those that are now in a VE zone um, that we're going to re require, you know, piling based foundations. Uh, if they are in a, a Limois uh, area, you know, certainly engineering for, you know, the lower level of the home. Um, and, and so it, do we have to say we're not going to participate in any of the residential uh, um, offerings uh, or can we segment uh, maybe with particular uh, attention to those homes that were affected by the recent change to VE zone, them becoming part you know, of a VE zone, uh, and uh, and then um, uh, and then and the, and the main reason I ask for, for that is that certainly with these the zones changing, uh, the property owners, uh, homeowner, you know, flood insurance can you know, be greatly impacted by that if, if they wouldn't comply and wouldn't elevate the home uh, and find themselves in a VE zone. So give me something with that. Sure, great question. Uh, based on past practice that I've personally seen on projects like this from FEMA, uh, where they have typically funded those projects are where you're doing blocks and tracts of land versus onesie, twosie types of approach that have repetitive loss associated to them. So under the HMGP, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program residential uh, section, that's type of projects they're looking at. And then as the chief spoke earlier, turn that into green space. So you break that chain of having to uh, replace homes or reconstruct homes after a flooding event. The other options that are out there uh, would be, <clears throat> excuse me, through the CDBG DR program, uh, that Amy Yearsley manages. Uh, there's another program under the National Flood Insurance Program. I think it's uh, Enhanced Code Compliance is the name of it. I'll have to verify that. But typically what that does is in this type of situation, it looks at someone that um, might not have repetitive loss, but now has to build or reconstruct their home to the existing code compliance. That program typically, because I think it's $30,000 to that homeowner to assist with that function. And that is part of the National Flood Insurance Program. So there's other opportunities, if you will, uh, for other funding sources uh, that would assist that type of homeowner. Shirley, did you have, or Michaela? Yeah. Hi, Shirley Valentin with Higher Key Consulting. I'm Michaela Shannon. Hello, to your question on the VE zone, so you are able to elevate homes in the VE zone, so if they end up within the new like you were saying with the ordinances or Speak a little closer oh I'm so sorry so you are able to elevate in a VE zone so if because the FEMA flood maps I know those just recently changed within Lee County so if you do have a home that repetitively flooded or severe repetitively flooded 
um, and we can do that benefit cost analysis, but those would be, I'm just saying you're able to elevate within a VE zone. Right, and my, my thought was is that I, the, the elevation, I'm sure, you know, is, is available, although um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple elevation. Uh, it's putting that home, you know, on a piling-based foundation. It's, it's having the engineering of the lower portion of the home meet, you know, limb one in, in, in many cases. And so, if you will, the affordability of it, if we go in that direction, $30,000 is, is a flea on a camel's back of yeah. what it's going to take financially to make you know, that accommodation for that home, so. Absolutely, yeah, no, so that home has to be feasible, so you you have to be able to elevate that home, uh, like if it's substantially damaged or it's just not feasible to elevate it, uh, th there has to be a, a different direction, sorry, <laughs> a different mitigation direct, direction like acquisition or mitigation reconstruction. However, in VE zones, you are, FEMA will not fund mitigation reconstruction in a VE zone. Okay, and the last question that I had uh, was uh, as it related to um, all of the generators that were being suggested uh, in the plan. I didn't see anything in there with uh, the thought of being prepared then for all the fuel requirements uh, for those generators. Uh, how would we handle that if we, if we bring, you know, an additional generator capacity, if you will, to the city, which I think is a great idea. Um, how do we deal with the fuel requirements of those and have we made accommodation for that in this plan? Uh, there's a few different ways that we could look at that through the projects. Uh, one would be looking at alternative fueling sources, for example, propane. Uh, so then you'd put a propane tank in. Uh, with the city, we do have a mobile uh, refueling vehicle that can go around. Uh, so those are part of the process, of, as Kirsten said earlier, about potentially grouping various projects also. That could be something that we look at also is what type of fuel that you'd want to have there to be most efficient and then also how you'd go about refueling. So, you know, from a diesel perspective, uh, in essence, we have that covered with the city's mobile refueling vehicle that we have. Uh, if we go propane, uh, potentially have uh, contracts that you put in place then uh, that would allow mobile propane trucks to go in, and refuel those tanks as well, which typically they have a, a longer running time associated to them compared to uh, generators that run on diesel fuel. So to follow up on that question too, some of something like that wouldn't qualify for HMGP, so it would be something that we would have to look at as a supplementary project to it uh, that would come through if that grant is awarded. So if, that's, if that comes forward, um, we've had lengthy conversations, um, even looking at our facilities, our fixed facilities, uh, getting all of those onto uh, kind of a dashboard internet-based thing. That way we could see how long their run times have been, how much fuel they've consumed, how much they have left in their tank. Um, so that way we're not out you know, dipping sticks in tanks like we were during Irma or Ian. Okay, thank you. And just if I can jump back to the, um, the elevation project, like you had mentioned, um, that's, if you look at just the structure cost, right, because it's not taking away the land value with it, by the time you look at elevating those properties and the cost that's associated with it, that cost benefit analysis goes in the opposite direction um, for the engineering, like you mentioned, to, to lift them and, and re-engineer them to that strength. So unfortunately, that's where you start looking at it's more cost effective to demo. Sorry. Okay, any other questions? Uh Comments. I think uh, I think uh, staff is definitely looking uh, for direction on the residential component uh, today. Um, I just had a couple uh, quick things, and, and then uh, I'll open the floor back up. Uh, the back on uh, February sixteenth, uh, Chief, you had uh, sent the uh, joint local mitigation strategy report to me that uh, ranks all the projects here in Lee County. Um, I didn't see that in the presentation here today. I don't know if you sent that to all of council, but if you didn't, I think it would probably be good information for all of us to have. Uh, so you can uh, see uh, as far as Lee County as a whole. Looks like uh, if you look at the, lot, the first 20 projects uh, that were ranked the highest uh, here in Lee County, looks like three of those uh, projects uh, are ours. Uh, the first one of course, you have the uh, potable water to the hospital. You have the city hall generator and hardening. And it uh, looks like um, the next one is uh, 
Station five. Where is station ten on that particular list? Do you know? Second the, page. The second one. Okay. All right. Um, and with the uh, just going back off of memory because I can't see it on here. Uh, I know in your uh, presentation today, Station 10, that was a $10 million project. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And when I review our st state appropriations that we are asking for this year, unless we change that, it says $8 million. So I don't, I, I don't know why that, that difference, but I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. Um, as far as the uh, residential uh, component, um, it looks like there's some additional funding opportunities for the residents over and above if, if we decide to go down that path. Uh, so I guess I would, uh, I would venture to uh, lean towards the experts uh, and staff that uh, make a recommendation that we do not go down that path. One of the things that uh, I heard in, in the uh, discussion was some of these projects is for the whole blocks. One thing with the uh, open green space, the last thing that I would, uh, and, and probably it wouldn't happen anyway, but I don't want to ride down, start riding down streets, and you see just one lot green, three or four houses, another lot green. Um, if it was a whole block approach, man, that could be a different story. Um, but, you know, I will uh, bear the advice of, of the experts, and uh, if you say that's a, a, a path we probably shouldn't go down, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, adhere to your advice. And I, I think I uh, need to hear from everyone on that particular topic. No, oh, if Chief. I can just, uh, yeah. So definitely in the acquisitions, I don't think that's the, the way to go. Like you mentioned, you will have a house and next to it, a house would be built that two, two years ago, which isn't going any place, right? So that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Station 10, uh, my understanding is there are certain things that HMGP will pay for, like they'll pay for the hardening of the structure and, and the building, they won't pay for furnishings. Okay. And so when you look at that 10 million plus, it's the, the 10 million plus the 8 million to make a total cost of, uh, of that project. Okay. Um, is there one other question, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think that was all I had, thank you. All right, um, so I'll open the floor up for everyone else, at least the residential component. I think staff is looking for a direction on Council Member Cosden. Thank you, just real quick, I agree on the residential component. I agree with you. Thank you. I would, I would follow the architecture as well. Yeah. Council Member Shepard. Same. 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 Agreed. Okay, get your direction. All right. It's like uh, next item on our list, and I want to thank everyone for the uh, presentation, all the hard work, and uh, we know this is a long process. We have a long road ahead of us, so uh, thank you in advance for all your hard work. All right, we'll move on to uh, item uh, 4B4, City Manager's uh, position vacancy. I'd added this, uh, I believe, on the agenda uh, back when we had talked about, um, you know, the direction we were going with the City Manager's. Uh, position. Uh, I do think we've, as a council, have had some additional conversations uh, pertaining to this. Uh, and if my uh, uh, interpretation of what was discussed was, I think it was council's direction to at least have the interim city manager uh, fill that position through our budget cycle, uh, which is somewhere uh, end of September, which is about seven months. We know that, um, you know, the uh, uh, process is probably, you know, if we do, if this council decides to do a national search, probably at least a four month process. Um, so I think what we probably need to try to do today, um, I know we go on hiatus uh, June 19th uh, through July 11th. Um, and I think the question that we need to ask ourselves uh, first, staff, if we decide to go down this path, staff will have to uh, give us some information on cost and firms. Uh, so I guess we need to find out uh, when would we like to have that conversation uh, in, in the future? Would we like to do it either before our hiatus, after our hiatus, um, or, or some other time? Uh, so I think that's. I think the discussion that we need to at least uh, 
have a direction uh, to know where, where we're headed in this process. Council Member Costa. Thank you, Mayor. Just speaking, as, cause I managed the process um, three years ago. So um, I feel like I have some advice I can offer. So I look back at my email. We started the process in May of 2020, and I believe Mr. Hernandez started in August. So it was a three month process. We, I was happy with the firm that we used. I, I don't know if we can go with them again or if we have to go through the process of choosing again. It was Colin Basinger and Associates. Um, so my suggestion, having looked at that, would be that we start immediately after hiatus. As long as we have all our ducks in a row before hiatus, as far as, actually we could get the firm started before hiatus, do their background work where they look for applicants and then start our interviews and everything in July. That would be my suggestion. And I also suggest that we wait until then to decide whether we're even going to do the search. I don't want to do an expensive search if we all have the same conclusion about the current city manager, but I think we need to give it time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for me personally, I'll say that um, I think uh, since we're going on hiatus, it looks like around June 19th, the meeting prior to that, uh, staff could at least uh, bring any um, firms that are interested in, in doing a search uh, and then we can have that discussion then, how we want to move forward, who we want to pick as far as the firm, uh, and then uh, uh, kind of finalize exactly the direction that we want to go in. Uh, because then if we start uh, somewhere in July, you got July, August, September, that three months kind of uh, um, falls into play with that timeline. So that would be my suggestion, bring it back the meeting prior to July and at least have a further discussion and uh, have maybe our HR department uh, bring any available uh, search firms that would be interested in, uh, in what that cost would be. So, Council Member Long. Thank you, yeah, Mayor, I don't, I don't disagree. I think at the very least that would be what I'd, I'd be willing to do here today. I, don't, I certainly don't wanna set a date where we start interview or that process. Uh, like I said, at the very least, set a date in the future where we talk about it again. Uh, one of the things that we had previously discussed uh, that you had, had um, referenced was that, that you wanted to try to avoid disruption in, in this process with the current city manager. Um, and so I think we'll talk about this more in the future, but if we did start that process in July and it was his desire to continue or to put himself in, in contention, then that creates more disruption because now he's dealing with that uh, part of that um, hiring process, so to speak, if he was to enter himself into that while we're going through that budget cycle. Um, so just something to consider since disruption was one of the main points that was brought forth as a reason to, to put this off uh, a little bit. Um, but yeah, at the very least, I, would, I would, um, wouldn't want to do any more than set that discussion uh, as far as the potential headhunters uh, at a date in the future. Thank you. Uh, Council members, thank you. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I too agree that uh, we shouldn't take immediate action on, on uh, um, on, a, on an executive search uh, at this point. I also uh, think that uh, while it's not a decision we would make uh, directly, based on current events and uh, a number of um, moving parts, I believe that in conjunction with this, we need to um, reconsider uh, our search for our city attorney um, with kind of a number of um, how one decision affects another decision and the capacity of us to make good decisions and have solid ground to make them on. Uh, I would think that, I would think that uh, in light of current events, we should also reconsider uh, how we proceed with replacing our city attorney and uh, a, a decision on whether to or not to uh, give a notice of non-renewal there. Councilmember Hayden. Yeah, I'm not willing to revisit the city attorney at this point, but I do agree that having that conversation about the city manager position at that meeting in July would be fine because when we get back after break, we're gonna to be totally immersed in the budget anyway. So our focus uh, might be in a different place. Thank you. Okay, anyone else wanna weigh in? I think we need at least a majority uh, uh, Council, as far as for direction, anyway. 
you, Councilmember Cummings. I'm in agreement waiting until after we get back from hiatus uh, and hold off on the search until we kind of get back to see where we're at. And if we're going to be in the middle of budget, um, would, you're claiming it could go into September, correct? So, so should we have an extension on the interim city manager so it doesn't disrupt that budget? Well, I think it's a valid point that uh, Council Member Long brought up. Um, you know, the, the, the whole reason why we, I think, came to a consensus to wait is uh, we want to focus on the budget. Yep. As like Council Member Hayden had just mentioned, and, uh, you know, I, not that I forgot, but I didn't take into account, we're going to be pretty busy as a council uh, from July until September. Uh, so with that being said, um, I would be inclined probably to, let's get through budget, and then we start having, uh, you start interviewing candidates and, and going down that path. I think uh, for me, that may be the best course. Uh, let's get through the budget cycle. If we're gonna start uh, interviewing candidates as a council and going through that process, we probably don't wanna do that until after, after the budget cycle. So that, that would be, uh, I think, my I'm preference. Agreement. Now, now, now that I've heard from a couple of you and, and uh, refreshing my memory as far as why we are actually waiting. Council members, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so w would it make sense then to put a target on when uh, we would put a search firm in, into action so that we would then have uh, that to, to at our ready when we come back from hiatus? Um, based on uh, council member Kaz and, and, and saying that it was about a three month process. Um, if we wanna be able to pick this up in October, then should we begin that actual search process in June or July so that that information is there when we come back in October, if you will, after budget? Um, I'm just trying to yep. the back anything the clock up. The only comment I'll make to that, that three month process, Council was engaged through that process. You know, they, we may uh, uh, advertise for 30 days or whatever it is. That last 60 days, council is pretty engaged in the process. So if our desire is to get through the budget, I'm thinking maybe we come back first meeting of September um, and then start having the conversation with the firm, get them up and running, uh, because they're gonna be doing a search while we're finalizing the budget. And then that gives us the October, November time frame uh, where the budget's completely done that we can concentrate on that. So uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking anyway. So did I hear you say oh, that we would start the search in September? Yeah, we'll bring it back for uh, uh, one of our first meetings in September to have that discussion. Uh, I think HR can bring back, hey, here are the firms. Maybe th these are the cost. We have that discussion then. We identify a firm, we identify the process because that's something else that we need to talk about um, and how we're gonna do the ranking, how we're gonna do the interviews, the one-on-ones, are we gonna have something very similar to that we did before? We not only had one-on-one -on -one interviews, we had public interview, you know, that whole process I think we need to outline and maybe the first week of September would probably be a good time frame to have that discussion uh, and then move forward accordingly on the council's uh, desire at that time. Okay, thank you. So I guess, uh, are we all in agreement with that, that sort of process? Yes. All right. Yeah. all right, that's how we'll move forward then. All righty then, uh, I don't have any other items on the agenda. Uh, as far as under 4B discussion, item five is round table discussions. Um, the only item that I had on for a roundtable discussion that I'd like to ask council, uh, back in October of 2021, uh, the then sitting council had a discussion on um, security measures throughout City Hall. Some of those items uh, we moved forward with. Uh, some of those items um, we had listed, uh, we had put on hold. Uh, so since we have a new council in place now uh, for the next two years, hopefully, um, I think it's an opportunity where we can sit down, 
revisit those items that we kind of put on hold, maybe any other future uh, concerns that staff may have. Uh, so I would ask if we could have uh, a shade meeting because uh, when it comes to security measures, we can have a shade meeting. And uh, what I was going to ask uh, council is uh, our next meeting uh, next week, I believe is March 1st. Could we have a shade meeting at three o'clock maybe to discuss some of those security uh, concerns that either we as council or staff may have. So I just want to see if everyone's uh, available at that time period. March 1st is a regular uh, council meeting at 4.30 p.m. So I figured we could have the shade meeting at 3 p.m. Does it? Three. three. Does that can work we, for everybody? Can we do 3.30? Three, three I have a 3 o'clock already on my calendar. Well, that, that's only going to leave us that one hour f to have a uh, discussion for security measurement. And, you know, I was hoping we could get through it. Yeah, I'll reach out to the person I meet. Yeah, okay. All right. All right, is that okay with staff, um, Mr. City Manager? Okay. All righty, that's all I had. Any other uh, roundtable uh, discussions? Yeah, my recollection, if I recall correctly, that was a recommendation that uh, uh, Mr. Hernandez had uh, requested, and uh, I think I had brought it forward for a discussion. Um, so with that being said, I think two things. Number one, um, I'd like to hear from you know our interim uh, city manager to, to get his uh, position on it. Um, and then, then I'll open up the floor for discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Um, our staff has adjusted to the new schedule. Um, we recently came from the last one. So, I mean, if, if the will of council is to go back to evenings, uh, we could accommodate both, but I mean, we, we've made this work. Uh, if this is your will, we'll stay with this as well. So we, there's no preference from our, our side either way. Okay, Council Member Costin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I think having a nine o'clock meeting um, is important for public input. A lot of people have complained about 4.30 meetings and how it's hard to get there and provide input. Um, also, so I'm in favor of keeping it at nine o'clock. Um, well, I understand the work conflict, but for me, an evening is a family conflict. So I think either way, some of us are gonna have issues with whatever time it is. Um, I also think it makes sense because these meetings can go on for hours and hours and for staff and for our sake, it, it gives us more time. So that's what I think. Thank you. Council member Cummings. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm in favor of the 430 mainly because there is so much that goes on in council. Uh, people think it's part time. It's really not. We're involved in so much outside of the chambers as well. And we also have everyday jobs that we need to be at. Um, and I just feel that it, it, it's, we don't even know what time that we're gonna end on a Wednesday. So it's hard for me to say, hey, I gotta be back at the studio at two o'clock. I can't make appointments, so I have to close my whole day out on Wednesdays because I'm dedicated to um, being here during our Committee of the Whole meeting. When we do the 4.30s, I can roll out my whole evening and mark it off. So if we're here an extra two, three hours, at least I know it's marked off. 
and I definitely understand being a mother how, how it's very difficult to juggle everything. But I also you know, have a financial responsibility. So I'm trying really hard to give all my all here as well as my all at the studio and for the family. So I'm trying to balance everything out. I'm for the 430, but if we stick at the nine, I'm fine that fine for that as well. But I feel um, for my business, it would be much easier if I came in at 430 in the evening. And plus a lot of the residents are very confused. I've heard this a lot. So, okay, this Wednesday is 430 or is it nine? So I feel like that's kind of a little confusing as well, but that's just my input. Thank you. Council member Welsh. <clears throat> I prefer to keep uh, the cow meetings at nine in the morning. Um, you know, when I, when I ran for council, um, I'm dedicated to the citizens. So for me to say that, um, you know, I'm coming in after my day job to decide things for the city, I'd, I'd rather be here fresh in the morning and have all the city staff here fresh in the morning and then try to push a meeting uh, potentially into eight or nine o'clock in the evening after a full day's work. So I like having these cow meetings um, where there's nothing else on my schedule. Thank you. Council Member Steinke. Thank you. I would, I would speak in favor of uh, keeping them uh, at a nine o'clock meeting uh, for a variety of reasons. One of them is staff. I absolutely agree that uh, the meetings, when we start them at 4.30, they can go until eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. We've seen it happen. Uh, and uh, our staff, uh, they have lives that they have to live as well. Uh, and, and for me, I, I Personally, I'm, I'm not a, a mom or a dad that has to stay home uh, for that, but I do, I do um, value my personal life uh, and uh, to take another uh, off work time away uh, per month, I'd prefer not to do that. So I would speak in favor of keeping them at nine. Yeah, for me, uh, I, I mean, I can, I'm here either way, you know, uh, I'm dedicated to serve the city. So wherever the majority uh, wants to go, uh, I'm okay either way. I just think when you look at it as an organizational decision, not a personal decision, it's probably best to keep the meetings at nine o'clock uh, on, um, on Wednesdays. You know, when it comes to citizens' input, there are individuals that work uh, in the evening, so they don't have that opportunity. So when you have nine o'clock on one week and 4.30 at another week, those individuals that may, may work the evening shift the individuals who work in the hospitality uh, businesses throughout our, our community that that are usually busier in the evenings than, than in the mornings. Um, so that kind of gives everybody the opportunity to come in. So, you know, I think uh, organizationally, um, I think nine o'clock makes more sense. Uh, the county does both of their meetings in the morning, um, you know, when it comes to their committee of the whole uh, or their or their commissioner meeting. So, uh, you know, it, it's done, uh, you know, with many other organizations. So I think nine o'clock we've been here. I think we've went back and forth a couple of times. Uh, cause I remember, uh, we, we went back to nine and we went back to four thirty. We went back to nine. I just, just try to stay consistent. So. Mr. Hayden, council member Hayden. Let's start at 7 a.m. Let's just, let's just, <laughs> hey, I get up at 5.30. I'll, you won't have a complaint. I, I think back to that eight-hour cow meeting that we had. Um, yeah. uh, I think the flexibility with starting earlier in the morning, depending on how packed the committee the whole agenda is, allows us more time to uh, get through issues. So I'm good with nine. Yeah. yeah, and I've been here for the uh, midnight meetings, and I can <clears> tell <throat> you it's not fun. Right. <laughs> okay, any other roundtable discussion? Yes, ma'am. Microphone. I do have a question. Um, th this has to pertain with Friday with Rob Hernandez. Um, this is for our city attorney, Dolores. I, I have a question. Um, do we have directors of officers insurance or do we have the errors or in emissions insurance for what we're going through at this moment? with Rob Hernandez if, if we move forward to going into the court setting. I have verified with our, um, <clears throat> with the city's um, 
risk manager that we do have the um, public service equivalent of the director's and officer's insurance. And when we leave here today, I will further discuss that with her to make sure that there's been no gap in communication. I will also say to the council that I have recently discovered that the insurance that we have through FMIT includes provision of a labor law firm to even guide us prior to litigation. I will be, I was in touch with them yesterday, but they had to call me back. So they haven't done that yet. So my, my question with you, Mayor, is how can we um, talk about the insurance that can be provided for us with this possible lawsuit that's coming forward? I, I, would, I would think that uh, that's something that the uh, city attorney, once she has a full understanding of what's available to us, uh, could reach out for one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of us. So we're all aware of exactly what we have, uh, what opportunities that we have as, a, as an organization. I will also keep you apprised as to the various statutes that provide for coverage under certain circumstances, because I think you would find that to be interesting as well. Okay. Good. All right. Any other roundtable discussions? Okay, seeing none, time and place of the future meeting, we have a shade meeting uh, of the Cape Coral City Council, which is scheduled for March 1st uh, in room 228, if that's available, um, at 3 p.m. We also have a regular meeting of the Cape Coral City Council scheduled for Wednesday, March 1st, beginning at 4.30 p.m. here in Council Chambers. We have a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is adjourned. Meeting is adjourned.